Okay, members of council, we do have quorum. This meeting is now resumed. Uh, Councillor Cressy, please. Thank you. I would like to call upon Mayor Tory to make an announcement. Well, good morning, uh, Madam Speaker, and good morning, uh, Councillors. Uh, Let's see now. There we are. Good morning, Madam Speaker, and good morning, Councillors. Uh, it's an honor for me to stand, uh, I hope on behalf of us all, uh, in the Council today to help uh, raise awareness about the importance of organ donation. And I think uh, people have been given on their desks that they're supposed to have been uh, a green ribbon uh, to wear today. Uh, and that is because the month of April has been, de has been designated as uh, Be a Donor Month in Ontario. And I know that uh, most of us support uh, saving lives through organ and tissue donation, but the fact is that not just this microcosm of the population, but in the population as a whole, uh, only a minority of people have actually taken the step of uh, registering themselves uh, so as to indicate their willingness uh, to be donors. I know in my own case, uh, until a few years ago, I hadn't bothered. Uh, in the old days, you merely had to fill out something that was attached to your driver's license, and I had done that, and then we switched to the permanent driver's license, and there's no place to fill out a form. Uh, but I was on the subway one day and got off at St. Clair, and there was a table there where they were setting up with the head laptops and so on to actually register you. It took two minutes, and I did it again. I mean, I had, I, I had, I had it lapsed when my driver's license went away from being paper. And so I will just confirm uh, what the uh, you know, material says that comes from the organ donation people, which is that it's very simple uh, to register. And uh, it, it is something where the shortage of people who've registered causes long wait lists to occur. So today, as we speak, 1,500 people are on the wait list for a life-saving organ transplant, and 350 of those are from Toronto. So these are our constituents, our residents, uh, 350 of them, and it really doesn't matter. The other ones are all human beings who live uh, with us here in Ontario. And as you know, because I'm sure we all have constituents and friends who go through this, some of them are on dialysis for years, which is not a pleasant experience for them. And, uh, you know, looking at it from the business case standpoint, it's not, uh, it, it is an investment of considerable resources on the part of the healthcare system to help them. Other people are waiting for new lungs so they can breathe properly again. And um, these are very human uh, stories that uh, relate to uh, people not able to live uh, a full life when, in fact, we can help them. Uh, we can help them. Uh, these are like preventable, uh, you know, preventable circumstances these, find the, find, these people find themselves in. Uh, so every three days, unfortunately, somebody dies waiting for a transplant. There are the heartwarming stories. And I don't know if you read a Canadian press story carried in the Toronto Sun this morning, but again, it was a Toronto story about a gentleman by the name of uh, Muhammad Khan, and there he was being embraced by a woman by the name of Kelly Bryant, and they were complete strangers from one another, uh, and Muhammad Khan was given a liver transplant by Kelly Bryant, uh, who came forward, and Ms. Mr. Khan's wife, I think, as part of their way of saying thank you for this, gave a part of her liver to some other complete stranger. I mean, these are great kind of Toronto Canadian stories that sort of show um, that what can be done, but you have to have the willingness to step up and be a donor uh, in order to make that kind of thing happen. So what we really want to do is take all those numbers I referred to before, the waiting list, the people who are having trouble breathing, the people who are on di dialysis down as close to zero as we could get by making sure more people uh, uh, become donors. And the way people can register for those who are watching and for those of us who can help uh, through our uh, platforms that we're given uh, in this job is to go to www.beadonor.ca. It takes two minutes. Uh, they say that it can help save up to eight lives and, and help as many as 75 other people through the gift of uh, various tissues. And so um, I would just say that, uh, and, and one more thing to mention, by the way, uh, one of the reasons why, and these are just such points of pride that I don't think we focus on half enough in this city, the Toronto General Hospital was just named as one of the 10 best hospitals in the world by a very objective survey done, I think, by Newsweek magazine. One of the best 10 hospitals in the world right here in Toronto. And it's not the only one that would make that list best 10 cancer uh, centers, best 10 mental health centers, and so on. And one of the reasons they're in that rank of excellence is because of their particular expertise with transplantation. So here we have uh, one of the best places um, in the world for transplants, but one of the lowest uh, registration rates. And just as a matter of interest, Ontario has a 33% organ registration, organ donation registration rate. Toronto, 23%. So Toronto is 10 points behind the provincial average. And I'm just saying, I'm sure on behalf of us all, we can do better. Uh, and it would be great if 
some of you like me hadn't got around to doing this and you could just take the, it takes two minutes. Um, and it is something that I think actually could make a big difference to people and it's leadership that we can show uh, saying we've done it. So I hope that we'll all wear the green ribbon today and do whatever we can to help them in this cause which will save a lot of lives. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, I understand you also wish to make an announcement. I do, Madam Speaker. Do you, do you want me to make it at the podium? Whatever you wish. It. Oh, okay. Madam <laughs> um, Speaker, uh, we have a we have an interesting thing that has happened in the public service. Um, as, as councillors, we, we often look at uh, city solicitor uh, uh, Ms. Wahlberg and her staff as, oh, those lawyers, they're always making sure that uh, we are ethical, but they sometimes stand in the way of the things we want to do, and so we, we tend to take them for granted. Uh, but in fact, in fact, uh, I had a, a lawyer friend outside the public service call me recently and say, do you know you have an extraordinary person working away quietly in the city solicitor's office who has just been given a prestigious award by the Law Society. Uh, Nils Engelstadt phoned me and he said, uh, I, I wouldn't do this other than the fact that I know this is a person who, uh, of extreme humility who, uh, who will make sure that you never find this out unless I call you. And so I'm so glad that he did. Um, so I want to honor this morning uh, Amanda Ross who works in uh, Ms. Wahlberg's shop. She has been awarded the J. Shirley Dennison Award by the Law Society of Ontario. And she's been given it for a really lovely reason. She's being recognized for her longstanding commitment to Toronto's most vulnerable residents. Through her volunteer efforts with the Toronto Lawyers Feed the Hungry program, she has volunteered for lawyers and, and uh, has actually made this a very successful organization. She spearheaded their fundraising program and designed it in a model such that they, this is now a very sustained organization and can do great work for Toronto's most vulnerable. I know that that is near and dear to our hearts. We, we uh, uh, adopt policy and, and fund programs, hoping that we can do the best. But these efforts are, are what really make so many organizations able to really get through and break through and, and save lives. And so I hope you'll join me this morning in thanking Amanda Ross for her work through uh, uh, Lawyers Feed the Hungry program. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, I understand you wish to recognize a group in the chambers this morning? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. As the Peer Recognized Music Award, the Grammy, which started with the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, and of course we all know the origin of the word, it was originally the Gramophone Awards, <laughs> they're considered to be the highest industry honour among musicians. It was first awarded in 1959, in 2019, 22 million people watch the ceremony. This year an album, Decades in the Making, was created by Toronto musicians in York Centre and they received a nomination. <coughs> the Lost Songs of World War II by the Yiddish group Yiddish Glory was nominated for Best World Music Album. Led by University of Toronto professor Anna Sternheis, Yiddish Glory resurrects long lost songs that were thought to have been lost to history until a miraculous discovery at a former Soviet archive in Kiev. Ms. Sternheis, who is here with us today, teamed up with Juno Award-winning vocalist Sophie Millman and an incredible team of musicians, including Isaac Rosenberg, a student at William Lyon Mackenzie King in North York, to perform songs originally written during World War II by women, children, and refugees. The songs were originally collected by a team during the war, but shortly afterward, that team was arrested during Stalin's anti-Jewish purge, their work was confiscated, and they died thinking it was all lost to history. In fact, it had remained hidden until Ms. Sternheis discovered it in the National Library of the Ukraine. 
Ms. Sternheims had the choice to submit her name to the Grammy nomination as executive producer of the project or the names of the musicians, and she decided it's the musicians who des deserve the Grammy nod, so she is not officially among the nominees for the award. Please welcome in our chamber today Professor Anna Sternheis, creator of Yiddish Glory and leader of the project, Sophie Millman, singer, Isaac Rosenberg, singer, uh, David uh, Bookbinder, trumpet, and David Rosenberg, producer. And they're seated right over there, and we are so proud of their work. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you. So, members of council, we will now review and confirm the order paper. There are 33 items left on the agenda. Council has started but not completed the Mayor's second key matter, item EX 4.1, on Toronto's transit expansion program update and next steps. We will continue that debate as our first item of business today. Yesterday, Council decided to consider item PH 4.1, the final report on Don Mills Crossing, as the first item this morning. I propose that Council consider that item after the Mayor's key item. City Council will consider member motions at 2 p.m. if the Mayor's key matter is completed. Our first item after member's motion will be item CC 6.3, the Lobbyist Registrar 2018 Annual Report. I will now take the release of holds. Please put your name under request to question staff. Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Um, page 5, member's motion 6.5, which is my motion. I'm uh, asking council's uh, permission to withdraw this motion as uh, city staff have provided me with a briefing note on the impacts the financial impacts on the carbon tax with the city, and I'd request that that briefing note be circulated to uh, members of council so they know how, uh, how expensive the carbon tax is for uh, the residents of the city of Toronto. Thank you. So on page 5, MM 6.5, Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong would like to withdraw. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Holliday. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Speaker. Uh, it is a development matter on page page four, four uh, CC 6.6 45 La Rose Avenue I have an amendment uh, to put on the screen and I'd also like to express my thanks to the solicitor and her staff and the chief planner and his staff for all of their help okay this is on page four CC 6.6 6. Councillor Holliday has Thank an you. amendment it's on the screen we have a recorded vote. Recorded vote. Thank you. Councillor Karajanas, please. <coughs> Councillor Carroll, please. Councillor Matt Lowe, please. Councillor Karachanis. Councillor Cressy, please. The amendment carries unanimously 19 in favor. Item as amended. Oh, that was item. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wong Tam. Good morning, Madam Speaker. On page 4, CC 6.4, 1832 Eastern Avenue, 1 Gilead Place, and 2 Sackville Street, um, there is a request for directions report from the city solicitor. I would like to move an amendment to that and thank the city solicitor for his cooperation, Matthew Longo, in drafting this amendment. Essentially, we're setting up a construction uh, site plan working group uh, before, um, uh, before we finalize the approval of the site plan application. Okay, so it's on the screen. Recorded vote.
The amendment carries unanimously, 20 in favor. Thank you. Item as amended, on favor, carried. Um, Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the bottom of page three, CC 6.1, composition of council's appointments to the Toronto Re and Region Conservation Authority. I'd like to move an amendment uh, to add to recommendation B with the citizen appointees uh, and add that the majority of the recommending candidates be women. Michael. So you're amending it to the bottom line. Okay, the, this is on page three, CC 6.1, on the amendment. Is everyone okay with the amendment? Okay, so do you want to continue holding it? All right. Councillor Cresty, you have one too. You don't want to release yours? No? Councillor Lane, convince him. <laughs> All right. Do we have? Do we? Have, okay. Councillor Layton. Yes. <laughs> oh, I have a motion to add. Yes, thank you very much. The authorization of the release of uh, Section 37 funds to community matters related to mural art on Bell utility boxes. On favor, carried. Hmm? Councillor Matlow. What'd you just do? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, <clears throat> I move this uh, given that the deadline for the appeal is coming up. On um, favor, carried. That's it. Uh, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion to, uh, with regards to a piece of property in my ward I'm working on now, just to give you a heads up that that's coming. It's an urgent motion I'm going to be bringing forward. Okay, thank you. All those in favor of adopting the order paper? On favor? Carry. Okay, we will now return to item EX 4.1. If I can ask the staff to put the list on the screen. Councillor Cole to speak. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. If I could have my motion up on the screen, please. This in regards to the provincial transit plan. Okay, oh. there it is. Uh, one of the major concerns I have. You have to say, you have to introduce your motion. Yeah, I'm introducing my motion that the City Council direct that if there are any provincial transit costs passed on to the City of Toronto as a result of the $17.3 billion gap in the province's transit expansion plans, these costs should be itemized on any future property tax bills as, quotation marks, the provincial transit plan tax levy. So basically, I'm trying to make it very clear that these transit plans that have been announced are not freebies. They're not going to be built for free. They're going to cost an estimated $28 billion. And I always have this issue when I go to schools, I say, how many million are there in a billion? You know that almost all the students can't get the right answer. They don't know that there's a thousand million in a billion. And the general population. So how many thousand billion, millions are we talking about here? And then we've got to make people aware that there's a cost to building these transit lines. Whoever decides on which lines, they're all going to be in the billions of dollars. 
On top of it, what concerns me is the $1.1 billion cut that's again going to cost the taxpayers of the City of Toronto. So I think we've got to be upfront with them, and we've got to include this line in future tax bills when it's determined how much they're going to stick us with for building lines in some cases we may not agree with. I, I also want to uh, <coughs> mention, you know, the context of this is I was over at uh, Angelina and Castro's house on Marley and Eglinton the other day, and we're talking about different things, and we're talking about the TTC transit. So her son, Nick Nicastro, pulls out a uh, napkin. He puts a napkin on a piece of paper and says, Mike, listen, you're, all these transit things are all a mistake. I got the right idea. I know what to do with your transit plan. So he gets a napkin. I says, Mike, can I borrow your pen? So there he goes on his napkin. He's drawn lines where he should have a circle line here, and this one's got to go up to Rexdale. And what about the people down there in Marie Curtis Park? They need a a transit line there, right, uh, Councillor Grimes? So, but this is what we're faced with, is we're having transit plans designed on the run, on back of napkins. And the other thing is, at least the napkin I saw in, with my own eyes, but these plans are very secretive. I mean, to this day, we still <coughs> refuse, or they still refuse to tell us the magic technology that's going to be used on our most important relief line. A 10.9 billion line, what is it? We're not telling you. How can we even take this seriously when we get this 10.9 billion line that's going to be critical to the future of Toronto and they don't even know or won't tell us the technology, and we've heard so many versions, it's going to be maglev, it's going to be uh, mini metros, it's going to be submarines, whatever it is. Every day there's a new guess of what this $10.9 billion expenditure is going to be and trying to get it through the Drown River. Anyways, I just wanted to say we've got to really be on our toes here because as much as we've got to remind ourselves, this is good news that we're talking about transit investment and it's great that the Premier is so interested in it. And I think that is something to, to welcome. There is interest, in, obviously, in transit at Queen's Park. And I, I just want to make sure that we uh, look at the big picture. And I know we get frustrated with Mayor Tory sometimes. We get frustrated with Chris Murray, our general manager. But they're in a very untenable situation where they're trying to be reasonable. They're trying to ask the right questions. It is not easy, and sometimes we express our frustration uh, with our uh, lead on this, but they have an, an incredibly tough job. I just also want to mention, you know, sometimes, you know, we forget that this is about the people of Toronto's transit. They paid for it. They built it. This future plans are going to run right through their neighborhoods for 10, 15 years of construction, mining, bulldozing, for 10, 50, so if you think, wow, I'm going to get a subway near me, just ask me about the Eglinton Crosstown, 12 years of hell we've gone through. And this is going to go right through the middle of the city, through the Don Valley. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Thank you. We do have questions for you. Councillor Holliday, three minutes. Um, thank you. Um, through you to Councillor Cole, it was mentioned that this is Toronto's transit plan. I take note that uh, some of the transit is regional in nature and it crosses into you know, Mississauga Peel, up into Vaughan, Richmond Hill. Um, I wondered through you to the councillor if he would also find it acceptable if those municipalities put a levy on their bill that says Toronto's transit plan and how the residents in those municipalities might perceive you know, the regional concept of this and if we do this, would they do that and would that be okay? <coughs> Well, it is in Toronto's transit plan that we're discussing here. We're discussing the province of Ontario's uh, four major priorities that were picked out by the province, by Ms. the mysterious Mr. Lindsay. So it's his plan that we're trying to figure out the impact of. So it's not Toronto's plan. Parts of it are Toronto's, but basically, it belongs to Mr. Lindsay, the mysterious Mr. Lindsay. I wonder, Madam Speaker, if I could answer the question, if it would be acceptable 
if the other municipalities okay, count, labeled Councilor it. Okay, Councillor Cole, just say yes or no. No, he doesn't have to. It's not an answer, period. Uh, yes and no. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Minnewong. Yes, Good thank you. Can, you. can you put the motion up on the screen? So you believe that the costs of this, tr uh, of the, uh, the implications, all these costs should be item on, itemized on the tax bill. Is that correct? I believe if there are Parts of the $17.3 billion that's supposed to be picked up by municipalities, like Toronto, which will bear the brunt of it, we should let the people of Toronto know what part of that is a result of the uh, provinces unwilling to put the $17.3 billion in their budget, and they put it into our budget. So I think the public has a right to know how much they're paying for it. Okay, so the public has a right to know what these additional costs are. Given that, can you tell me how much it's going to cost to put these, the, the, this on the tax bill, if you're so concerned? How much is it going to cost? Well, I think it's pretty easy to just add another line on a tax bill with the uh, computer digital technology we have. It's not that you have to do it manually. So you haven't, you haven't calculated <laughs> the costs? I think it might be... A lot less than the $17.3 billion we're asked to pay for. Oh, so you, don't, you, you want one set of costs itemized, yet you don't know the other costs. I think there's a big difference Thank between you. a line item on a tax bill and $17.3 billion un unaccounted for by the province of Ontario that we may Th have to pick up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wong Tam, clarification. Yes, thank you very <laughs> much, uh, Councillor Cole. Um, your, your motion is really to provide uh, greater transparency to the, the taxpayers of Toronto, is that correct? Yes, uh, because they, many taxpayers have been told in previous years that these subway lines were going to be free, that there was no cost to them, and someone else is paying. Uh, so that's why I think it's important to be transparent with people that there is a cost. And even if the $17.3 billion is somehow adjusted downward uh, because uh, Vaughan may pick up a piece or Mississauga may pick up a piece, uh, it's still important in your opinion, and, and this is by way of your motion, uh, to ensure that taxpayers uh, fully understand uh, what, where their tax dollars are going to. Is that correct? Exactly. And how much these transit projects, which everybody loves until they see the sticker price, uh, they should know what it costs. And uh, to see it on a tax bill might make people realize we all want transit, we need it, but there's a huge multi-billion dollar cost to it. And I think, as you said, Councillor, for transparency's sake, we've got to be straight with people and say this new plan, which is great to see all these announcements, but you're going to be picking up the bill. The people of Toronto will be paying for it in their taxes for the next 20, 30 years. And just my final question, there, there has been a precedent uh, set before City Council where we've itemized this very special tax levy and, 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 and credit it to, to such, whether, whether it's a city building fund or the Scarborough uh, uh, extension fund. Uh, we, this is not the first time we've done this. Okay, thank you. Is that correct? Yes, and uh, again, there is precedent for it. And I think that people have a right to know what the cost is going to be picked up on their tax bill. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I had a motion, uh, but thanks to uh, Councillor Robinson, it's not necessary anymore. And that was that we uh, state quite firmly to the provincial government that we are opposed to the change in what was arranged with the, uh, with the gas tax financing to help pay for our state of good repair. And I'll get into that a bit in a second. Um, I'll also be supportive of the mayor's motion, much, much like my colleague, Councillor Perks. Um, I, I think it provides clarity in that w the city is not endorsing in any way the, the province's uh, proposed changes to Toronto's transit plan. I'll also be supportive of Councillor Matlow's motion. I'll say just quite very quickly um, that we haven't issued the RFP yet for this project. And if there is an opportunity for us to return to an expert-driven plan rather than continue down this, this political, very, very politicized plan for public transit in Toronto. It's now. I do realize, though, this, this door is closing, this window is closing, 
and uh, that, that it may be, in fact, the last vote that I cast against uh, moving ahead with, uh, with, with our current transit plans. Um, finally, I'll also be supportive of Councillor Cole's motion, because um, I think it's important for us to, uh, uh, to, 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 to demonstrate this Doug Ford tax on the, uh, uh, to the residents of Toronto who won't understand it, because really what they're doing is uh, the province is picking our pocket here. They committed this money to fund state of good repair for public transit, something we've been fighting for for years, and now they're backing out of that. And it's going to cost Toronto residents. It's going to now be on the backs of Toronto residents, despite the fact that those aren't the only individuals who benefit from a, a strong public transit system in, in, in Toronto. Everybody benefits. Everyone in the GTA benefits from this because it allows uh, the, the, the commerce, the economic engine that is uh, the City of Toronto to function properly and to have its arteries moving people around uh, um, quickly and efficiently. Look, all of these recommendations and this entire debate hinges and rests on one simple assumption that is false. We hear about people talking about good faith, going to the table in good faith, going to this, uh, uh, going to this discussion in a very uh, uh, rational way. But we're not working with a rational actor. Like th we're, we're, we're discussing in good faith, but they're not. The province is not rational or thoughtful in this. They're not driven by fact in any form or fashion. We have seen that our pre we've seen what the Premier can do. He's devoid of fact in not only a transit debate, but just about every debate that they have at Queen's Park. He cla he's, his claims are, are as much a bumper sticker than, than actual public policy. Uh, and he was central to cancelling and, de and, and destroying transit in the city the first time and delaying the, the, the advancement of, Scar of, of transit in Scarborough. That would be opening this year. He was, he was in intimately involved with that. And now he's doing it again. And much, much worse, he's actually now going to be responsible for further delays with our state of good repair. There was a report in the Star just earlier today about why that January slowdown, one of the worst delays in history, was caused, and it was caused by maintenance. And you know what, that's gonna get worse, because we've got this billions, tens of billions in backlog, and we don't have anything to pay for it. So he's just announced, not only is he gonna delay transit expansion in the city of Toronto, but he's actually gonna break the system we have. And yet we're going back to this table, and we're saying in good faith, uh, we're gonna keep having this negotiation. And at the same time, he's working to destroy it. Now, you don't go into a negotiation and, and if the other side just keeps spouting half-truths and not telling you the full story, do you continue to sit there? Do you continue to take it? If you're sitting at the table and you're being dealt cards over and over again and it's always a losing hand, well, you got to know when to fold them. You got to know when to walk away. And you got to know when to run. Thank you. I thought you were going to sing. You got to know when to hold them. Know when to Okay, there's no singing in the council chambers. <laughs> Councillor Fletcher. You're up. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor McKelvey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yesterday morning, I spoke about the over 500 residents that have contacted my office by email and petition to express their support for the Eglinton East LRT to Malvern. Last week, I attended a town hall held by Scarborough Transit Action with Mayor Tory and Liberal MPP Mitzi Hunter for Scarborough Guildwood. This meeting was attended by over 200 residents that expressed overwhelming support for this vital investment in infrastructure in Scarborough. If you won't listen to me about the importance of this project, then perhaps you should listen and read the submissions to the Mayor's Executive last week from key stakeholders, including the University of Toronto, Centennial College, Scarborough Hospital, Renew Scarborough, 
the Scarborough Campus Students' Union, Scarborough Community Action Network, and numerous other local community associations. Scarborough isn't fighting Scarborough. We are united. We are all calling for this project to go to Malvern. Our residents recognize that the Eglinton East LRT will provide us with less time on the bus and more time with our families. I was extremely disappointed that yesterday, Councillor Matlow, who claims to want more transit for Scarborough, put forth a motion that would only see the Eglinton East LRT constructed to the UTSC. This is counter to the Mayor's Executive Meeting last week and City Council's 2018 decision to build the LRT to Malvern. I can't believe that Councillor Matlow, who is swimming in subway stops, streetcar stops, and soon LRT stops, is picking on the transit-thirsty community of Malvern. Councillor Matlow, swimming. Malvern residents spend way too much time on the bus and out in the cold. Scarborough residents are losing hope. City Council needs to signal to Malvern and to the other priority neighbourhoods in Scarborough that they matter. I encourage you to vote no to Councillor Matlow's motion so that the city can continue with the planning, design and engineering of the Eglinton East LRT fully to Malvern. Let's tell the residents north of the 401 that they matter too. Thank you. Councillor Karagiannis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, appreciate the uh, opportunity to weigh in on this uh, subject. For years and years and years, we've been talking about transit. For years and years and years, we've been debating transit. Unfortunately, last time we built anything in Scarborough was in 1978. In the early 90s, we had a uh, subway extension along Shepherd and it miraculously stopped at Don Mills. And the people of Scarborough Agent Court, people of Scarborough North, and all the residents north of the 401 are looking for that to be extended and to come into Scarborough. Madam Speaker, we have something like 20,000 doors coming between Victoria Park and Shepherd all the way out to Midland and Shepherd in my ward, and there's a couple of more thousand in uh, <coughs> Councillor um, Carol's Ward, just at Victoria Park and Shepherd. And those people need transit, and those people need to come downtown quickly. When I was just elected, a school came to my ward, and I still have it on my door down at the, my office, and it says it took us one hour and 15 minutes to come from Scarborough to City Hall, and we demand faster traffic. Now, those were grade eights. Now, those grade eights right now are about to finish high school and they probably will wait until their children are born before they see anything happening in the north part of Scarborough. It looks like the north part of Scarborough is uh, designated as a second class citizens area that they live. And I hear my fellow councillors say, you don't need a subway out there, uh, you can get an LRT. And I hear my uh, colleague beside me saying, we don't need uh, subways in Scarborough. I, I disagree. You know, you got a lot of subway stops, as my colleague said. But I'm not going to pick on you today. That's not a day that we pick on uh, Councillor Matlow. What I am yes, yes, asking yes. for <laughs> and what I am saying to you folks is we need to make sure that we have a transit plan. The one-stop subway that I supported from uh, Kennedy and Eglinton out to um, Scarborough, uh, Scarborough Civic Center. The mayor referred to it yesterday. There was going to be a mecca. And this is going to be a mecca that was going to be built at Scarborough uh, Scarborough, community, uh, Scarborough Civic Center just behind there at Scarborough Town Center. That's about 20,000 doors. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, there's 20,000 doors coming fast and furious along Shepherd. Shepherd is going to be the new Young Street of Scarborough. And if we do not provide for it a subway and eventually join the relief line that the, uh, that the Premier says is going to stop at uh, Eglinton and uh, Don Mills, take it all the way up either to Don Mills or around Victoria Park, if we don't do that, we're not going to have a complete circle. People that would be going on one-stop subway or the three stops that uh, the Premier is uh, now talking about to Scarborough Centre, they shouldn't be just stopping there. There should be a loop that they can come around. And I've heard from my good friend, uh, Councillor Pastor, and he says, what about extending the subway west on Shepherd 
to uh, Dufferin. Well, or Don's view. I think that should be a priority, and I think we should look at having a subway that will run right across the north part of Scarborough, right, right across the north part of the city that would eventually end up at the hub that we're all talking about at the airport. If you want to go to the airport right now and you live in my part of the world or in Scarborough North in uh, Councillor Lai's ward, you'll have to come downtown if you want to take transit. You're going to have to take, come downtown and from here grab the UP in order to go out um, to the airport. The other option that you have is to take uh, PTC or to take a taxi cab. Well, if you live downtown and you're south of Bloor Street or on Bloor Street, you can certainly take public transportation to go to uh, the airport. If you live above that, you can certainly do, but until Eglinton, you can probably do something. But north of Eglinton, you, there's not very much. I see the city divided as Lakeshore to Bloor, Bloor to Eglinton, Eglinton to the 401, and God help you if you live north of 401 and east of Victoria Park. God help you if you live in Scarborough, north of the 401. Nobody seems to care. We, it's an area that's totally been forgotten. It's about time that we stop using my, uh, my residence and the residence of uh, Councillor Lai and part of the uh, uh, residence of uh, uh, Councillor McElroy, and make sure that they also get what they pay for. We contribute to the tax base. We contribute to what is called Toronto. But unfortunately, it seems that Toronto has forgotten the people north of the 401 and east of Victoria Park. That's a real shame. It's a real shame that our residents get treated differently. So I say to you folks, when you look at getting votes, when you look at a tax base, you do not forget those residents. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I feel like I have to speak to explain why I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote in, in what will seem like two different directions. I will be supporting Councillor Matlow's motion. And I know it won't pass. <coughs> and then I will be supporting Mayor Tory's motion because we need him to go in the strongest possible position to uh, Queen's Park. There's no doubt about that. But why will I be voting for Councillor Matlow's motion? Well, I made a promise years ago, standing on the steps of Centennial College in Scarborough. I made a promise to students there who were learning for the first time the night before they were going to lose a station right at their front door in the Transit City Line, the Scarborough LRT. They were just learning. I don't know why the MPP and the local councillor hadn't told them that they were getting that, but they didn't know. And I told them, tomorrow morning, you're going to lose it. And they were very upset, and I promised them that I would never vote in favour of, uh, of losing that. And, and that if there was ever a, a, an opportunity in this chamber to vote to save that line, because the cost of that line, fully funded by the province, meant that we could go to Malvern. Yep. That students at Lester B. Pearson, students at Mother Teresa, would have real post-secondary opportunity because we would be funding the line in such a way that we would be able to afford to build an entire transit grid throughout Scarborough and that I would always vote any time that opportunity arose. But I'm pragmatic. I know that at the end of the day, uh, these 25 councillors, we've heard the speeches, um, the old trope that we don't care about Scarborough if we represent somewhere else. But I do care. I've got a grandson who's he's only 12, but he's huge. He looks uh, older beyond his years, and thanks to Mayor Tory, he can ride transit free for another few months. And, and he generally takes the bus to basketball practices. But I gotta go every Thursday night out to pick him up at Lester B. Pearson. Because that's a bus ride that's too much to ask of a 12 year old. I have to go again on Saturday morning to Mother Teresa because his little brother's uh, practice is a little bit too much to ask on Saturday morning for, for mom to get up and be there at 8.30 if she's gonna take transit. And so I'm back and forth to Malvern because, you know, at the end of the day, it's about cars. We pick up a player who lives on, uh, I think it's Darby Court or Danby Court, who's pretty close uh, to Mother Teresa, but we pick him up because cars whip around there so much because there isn't a lot of transit opportunity. His mom's not even uh, uh, sure that he's safe walking over at MT. So we go and pick him up on the way. I know what they need, and I care about it. 
Heck, my family lives in Scarborough. I know what they need. A lot of them are seniors. My sister's a senior citizen. She's my older sister. Uh, but she knows that, that if we'd built that LRT grid, she'd got a short walk to her next stop. That's not the case with subways. It's not always a short walk to the next station when it's a subway. What they need are short walks and a real grid of transit. And we cared so much about them that we designed one. And so I promised that any time I had an opportunity to support that, I would. But I do want Mayor Tory to be able to go to Queen's Park with a solid position. So, you know, I will be joining you after I have, uh, I have supported Councillor Matlow's motion. But Madam Speaker, know this. We all need to know this. At the end of the day, we have to stop accusing each other of not caring about Toronto's residents wherever they live. We should be rising on a point of privilege every time someone does that. We make citywide decisions in here every day because all 25 of us care about Toronto's residents. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why I stopped myself, except that it jams up the works and the proceedings here. But I should be standing on a point of privilege every time Councillor Karagiannis accuses those who, because they don't represent a ward in Scarborough, they don't care about Scarborough. It's ludicrous. It's ludicrous to keep saying that year after year after year. It was Councillor Kelly before you, and, and it goes on and on and on. And that's just one of the lies we tell residents of Scarborough. It's just not true. I've never accused anyone here of not giving a damn about North York, because I know that all 25 people in here go through what they go to get elected because they care about this city. Thank you. And everyone Carol. in it. Thank you. Councillor Lai. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As a new councillor here, I've seen uh, from the outside, and now I'm in the inside. And I can't echo more with uh, <laughs> Councillor Kerrigenis and Councillor McKelvey what they are expressing about Scarborough. I promise my residents that I will stand up for Scarborough. I, pr I promise my residents that I'll put Scarborough back on the map. And now Scarborough, the transit plan of uh, uh, Scarborough is back on the transit map, which I'm just like a, a dream come true. I have uh, heard here that some of my colleagues say that Scarborough is for rich people, that they don't need uh, any transit, and uh, they're for better people, that they don't really need, need transit. I don't agree. In the 1970s, I commute from North Scarborough to come down to downtown to work, and I've been there, and I know how it is to have such a long commute time, and I think Scarborough deserves better. And I can't echo more with what Councillor Kirigenis and Councillor McKelvey uh, stand for Scarborough. And for the, I cannot support uh, Councillor Matlow's motion because I wanted the subway to go to Melvin Town Centre or whatever transit goes to the, the uh, Melvin Town Centre because it's very important for the people there that don't have any transit. And uh, one stop is going to be very important because we need to build integrated transit. We need to connect eventually from that. Okay, up, up uh, I'm to sorry, Councillor Lai. I put you, can I have some quiet, please? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I've been interviewed by Fairchild TV last, uh, in the last couple of days, and I told them I immigrated to Canada, to Toronto, my home, in 1972, and that that time, I, I immigrated from Hong Kong. There was no subway in Hong Kong. And now, 45 years later, the subway in Hong Kong is just like a web where Toronto has been just like, they just built a few stops. And I think it's, it's very, very important that, build, that we build transit. Someone is building transit now. We don't, we don't know how it is, but uh, if someone is paying, building transit, I will be always be supporting transit being built in Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I'll begin by placing a motion, which I believe is a friendly amendment 
uh, to the mayors. And this is very specifically confirmation uh, from staff when they report back in June that there will be no unreasonable delay to, and I list, all of our current uh, transit expansion plans. Uh, let me begin my remarks, first of all, by thanking our City of Toronto staff. It is not easy when you conduct five years, and on some lines longer, but five years of work to do the hard work of developing a transit expansion program, only to have a press conference arrive and a brand new map put in front of you, and then a request to report on that within a matter of days. And so for staff, I want to thank them. Uh, announcing transit is easy. Building transit is hard. And so if there's one message Torontonians have said to me in, in my five years here is that they are sick and tired of Torontonian or of politicians drawing a new transit map after every election. So, and Councillor Ainsley, if I can have the overhead, I want to walk through this just very briefly in terms of some recent history over the last 13 years. If I can have the overhead, please. I'll go back. Do we have? I'll go back on the overhead. Can I? Can you hold the time, Speaker? There we go. We'll start in 2007. So if I go back 13 years, we had a plan with the light rail across the city. Currently, Eglinton is under construction, and we should be going out to the tender on Finch shortly. And we've brought back plans for waterfront and Eglinton East. If I can go to the next map. Then we had 2010, and it was the campaign from former Mayor Rob Ford. I'll call this Subways, 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 all for free, and that was promised in 2010. Uh, nothing was built, if we can move on. Then we had then Mayor Ford. Again, this is what I will call Subways, Subways, Subways 2.0. Nothing was built. In fact, everything was delayed. Let's carry on. Then we proceed to the election in 2014 and Smart Track. We were told 22 stops with no tax dollars spent on any of them. We have six stops and we are using tax dollars for it, but they are being built. If I can go to the next map. Then we proceed to 2016. This was at Council the Peace in the Valley motion whereby instead of three stops, we would have one stop on the subway and an LRT as well for the price altogether. It turned out we only had enough money for the one stop subway and the LRT was lost. Go to the next map. Then we had the city council plan that we were supposed to be debating today. And the city council plan with our PTIF funding was the one stop subway, the six smart track stops, alleviating congestion at Young and Bloor and initiating work on the DRL with next year us determine prioritization for waterfront and Eglinton LRTs. If I can go to the next map. Then we had a press conference a week ago announcing subways, subways, subways 4.0. We are right back to 2010 when the same commitment was made and nothing was done. We can get rid of the maps now, Councillor Ainsley. So, if I could say one thing, it would be enough is enough. Enough of the politicians not coming up with transit plans, because that actually takes work, but drawing transit maps. I submit that just like in 2010, when then Councillor Ford promised subways, 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 and just like in 2012, when then Councillor Ford promised subways, 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 that none of these will ever get built. But it's worse than simply delaying transit. This province is cutting the budget for repairs. To, so there's less money to actually make transit arrive on time. This is a vicious cycle by design. The province breaks the TTC by not funding the TTC. They then propose to upload the TTC to, break the, to fix the system that they broke. And so for the largest city in this country, for the economic engine of this province, we cannot operate when we are treated like just another provincial department. In nine months, this government has cut council in half. They have cut $1.1 billion from our capital repairs budget. And now, without any consultation, they've provided yet another map. I cannot operate under these conditions, nor should we. And in June, if there is any further delay, Thank you. we stop. Thank you.
questions? Councillor Pasternak, clarification of the amendment. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, through you to Councillor Cressy. Uh, in your motion, you've said, uh, you've mentioned here line two, one stop extension, where in fact the report before us is referencing on page three a, um, a supporting a three stop line two extension. Which, which do you support? The, uh, do you want to go back to the one stop or are you supporting what's before us, the three so, stop? As a point of clarification, uh, our city manager stated very clearly yesterday that there is no recommendation in front of us to support a three stop. In fact, what our city staff report says very clearly and was reinforced by the city manager is that we are going to assess that and come back. There is no recommendation in front of us to support the three stop. What my motion says very clearly is that for Toronto's current transit expansion plans, that include the following. Smart track, six stops, the one stop extension, the overcrowding at Young and Bloor and the DRL. If in the assessment they come back and say this will delay those projects, we need to know in June. That is what this says. The, okay, the province has made it clear they want to have it as three stop extension. Are you saying that that's a non-starter, we want to stick with the one stop? I, I don't know. So let me be very clear. Is Last week there was a press conference where without any study and without any consultation, new lines were drawn on a map. In the staff report in front of us are 61 questions about that press conference. Those 61 questions are the basis of transportation planning. So what we have in front of us in, from a press conference is a map. We don't have a transit plan. And so my motion building on the staff recommendations is to ensure that if this transit map delays our actual expansion of the transit plan that we should know about it so if going to three it delays it we wouldn't support it absolutely if going to three means that scarborough residents are going to have to wait further for transit expansion then we need to know that and i would hope that in the interest of actually moving residents in Scarborough, that you would want to know whether we were going to cause them further undue delays as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Karajianis, uh, um, um, clarification. Clarification of the motion, uh, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for putting up all those maps. He did say about Smart Track, and he said that we're building it. Can you tell me what station we're putting shovels in That's the ground? Not That's not clarification. Well, he, he, he put the motion forward. Plan. I'm just wondering. No. That's not he, on our plan. Okay. Just You're welcome. That's clarification that, of the motion. Do the you have it? Clarification any? of the motion fine, is Madam the Speaker. clarification of what you see. I'm fine, Madam okay. Speaker, and thank you for okay. picking on me. Oh, 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 Jimmy. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm, I'm not even going to go there. Sorry, you can go there all you want. You I just get me real. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. I'll tell you what's not worth it. It's that piece of the land, please. Yeah. He's not worth it, trust me. I beg your pardon, Madam Speaker. Point of order. Point of order. Personal privilege. Point of personal privilege. Get them both. Yes. How dare you say I'm not worth it? I demand an apology. Just okay. All right. All right. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Why? Yeah, why not? Okay. Councillor Holliday, clarification of the motion. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I just wondered if I could ask the, uh, through you to Councillor Cressy uh, to define unreasonable delay in particular in the context of Eglinton because one of the proposals was to underground Eglinton Avenue. We had heard from staff that it would take longer to build Eglinton because it's underground and I wanted to know if that meant unreasonable or a delay even in the eyes of the councillor. Well, from my vantage point, I need our staff to report on what the delay may be. That is something we don't as of yet know, and those are some of the questions that staff have posed, and then it will be for council to determine whether that is unreasonable. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher to speak. Uh, yes, Speaker. I am going to support Councillor Cressy's motion and uh, what he had up as a plan. And I know that when the camera comes on me, we can now see that plan again. I also want to thank the staff who I've worked with for years on getting the environmental assessment 
approved for the relief line south and starting our work on relief line north, which is now part of my new ward thanks to the provincial government. I know they put a lot of hard work in that and it's not, uh, it's not been easy. But we did have a plan in 2007, it's been changed many times. And I just thank Councillor Cressy for actually showing us what we say is our, our transit plan. Because I don't think the public realizes that though it seems messy, we actually do have a transit plan. We might not all of us agree with all the aspects of that. Some people don't agree with Smart Track. Some people don't agree with the um, Scarborough extension. Some people are a little iffy on maybe the relief line if that's going to work. And Waterfront East and West and Eglinton East and West, we're pretty united on those. But there are some differences. But now's the time not to focus on our differences. The time is to agree that we actually do have a plan and to find out how it gets tested on what the provincial government has put forward. So just on the question about, well, do we, what do we do? Three stops, two stops? We have a smart track station at Lawrence. The same place you would put a station on the Scarborough subway extension. Do we need that? Different location. Maybe it's different, but do we need, how does smart track impact any of the stations? That's an important question. We are committed to smart track. We have the money for smart track. We have the money for all of those stations. We have the plan. Now we're negotiating with the provincial government, Councillor Karagiannis, to be the developer of those stations. They have put their stations out for private development. We have our stations, which we've always planned to pay for. So we could proceed with those as soon as we get the green light. As far as the relief line is concerned, I'm very interested to know everything about their plan, which is how will the new trains run? What do we need to do with the environmental assessment? How will they be changing the environmental assessment to go across the Don River rather than under the Don River? How do you get across the 500 meters at Laird Bridge? All of these things, and how do you do that two years sooner and cheaper than we would be able to do it? You know, if it comes back and says, we're not delaying very long and here's all the answers, that might be great, but I'm not going to, we have a plan. We have a plan for which we have an environmental assessment. I'm not throwing our plan out, and I think the public needs to know, we're not throwing our plan out. We're gonna test their plan against our plan. Because either we're standing behind our plan, or we simply might as well move up the street and sit in the Queen's Park. That's right. We have a plan. We should defend our plan as much as we can. I know some councillors can't defend this plan, but this is a plan. So let's not pretend that we're just sitting down here dithering and that we have this idea and that idea and we haven't done anything on transit, my friends. We actually have a plan and a plan to fund part of it. We have funds for much of it. We have funds for Smart Track. We have funds for Line 2. And we always knew the relief line was going to be paid by the province. So we have to comment on whether they're actually going to make that timeline that is, we know is necessary and the public knows is necessary. So this should be a moment where we come together, let the public know we have a plan and test anything the province is doing against that plan and here in June, if there are unreasonable delays on all fronts, now what are we going to do? Now what are we going to do? Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'll, I'll start off by thanking a number of people, first and foremost the Mayor and his leadership. I also want to thank the Premier with respect to his leadership on this file because that's extremely important. I then want to thank the City Manager and probably my thanks to the City Manager is probably, it brings it all together, it brings the City's plan and the Mayor's leadership, the Premier's plan and his leadership to the table where the city manager and our strong team of, of transit experts are actually at that table with Mr. Lindsay and others to discuss, to look at 
as Councillor Fletcher said, testing our plan against their plan, whether or not we augment it to add and so on. Resources we've been told are allocated uh, that are going to come to assist us and so on. So normally we shout at each other. Now there's an opportunity for us to talk with each other. And I think people want to see that. Clearly, as someone who is from Scarborough and had been articulating for quite some time about expanding the Bluer Danforth subway system into the heart of Scarborough, I'm very much for that. And I'm, yes, I support the three stops. If it was only one stop we were going to get, then I support that as well. And let me speak to something that was said by the mayor yesterday. He talked about development that's actually going to take place, Madam Speaker. There's a lot of it that's being planned not just the Scarborough Town Centre, the Oxford property, but also the other land developers who we've actually had meetings with over the last month have simply now come forward with plans to develop their lands. You know the reason why, Speaker? Because there's going to be a subway into the heart of what is our downtown that's never been developed in a very long period of time. The last time a commercial development took place in the Scarborough Center area was Concilium, which is, I think, was in the early 1990s or mid-90s. There hasn't been that. And so, in addition to that, and Councilor Karajanis talks about the 20,000 doors, it's more than just 20,000 doors in Scarborough Center. There's new parks, there's new roadways, new design. McCowan Road is going to be redone because of this new development. And we are taking into consideration all the impact on the people that um, a development will take place uh, because we know that that is a problem. Let me just turn my attention to Councillor Matlow for a moment. And I love Councillor Matlow. He is an amazing guy. I've had a great working relationship for a very long period of time and I will continue doing that. But I can't agree with respect to his assessment on transit for Scarborough particularly as it relates to, uh, I think, number three in his motion about um, just extending the, uh, the line. I know Councillor McKelvey spoke about that, deleting the word um, Malvern Town Center. The folks in Malvern have suffered for such a long time with the lack thereof of good transit. It does take them two hours plus to get to any place, I guess, uh, west of Young Street from Scarborough. And we certainly want to ensure that they're treated in a way that helps them with respect to their transit destiny. So we can look at the glass as being half full or... Okay, I think that Sorry, no problem. the... Councillor Matlow. I stand on a point of privilege. Uh, by the way, I, I think uh, Councillor Thompson's uh, comments were said in a very respectful tone, so I'm yep. not objecting to his tone. But, the, but it's been twice said now uh, that, uh, and this is an impact on my reputation, and that's why I stand, uh, that in some way my motion, in some way has any adverse effect on the residents of Melbourne. In fact, if one were to actually read my motion rather than just create rhetoric around it, you will see that my, what my motion does is it, rather than extending the uh, Eglinton East to Melbourne, it extends the seven-stop LRT. But, Madlow, that's not a point of personal... Well, it is because no. the characterization, Madam Speaker, the characterization is that somehow um, my motion has, is taking uh, transit away from Melbourne. No. Uh, bo both councillors have, 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 have just said that, and that's just the opposite of the truth. My motion actually... Um, not only connects Malvern to the transit, the, yeah. the rapid transit network, but it does it faster yeah. with the seven no, stop sir, rather than That's not a needs. point of personal privilege. Thank you. So, uh, well, no, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Matlow. Councillor Thompson, would you like to continue? Uh, uh, Mayor Tory. I'd suggest we could look into that one at the same time as we look into the suggestion on Twitter yesterday that advice offered from TTC and city staff was dishonest. We, we perhaps could take them together and look into them both. Yes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes. Thank so, you. Okay, so, Councillor Thompson, you'd like so, to continue? Yes, uh, yes, Speaker. So uh, I'm very pleased with respect to the direction that we're going in, and particularly that table where we're going to be able to bring our plans forward to compare that and contrast that with that as being proposed by the province. Clearly, this is an opportunity for us to be able to address the needs of transit 
uh, that is certainly lacking in this city that's been uh, people have been asking for for quite some time but finally you have a premier who is interested in talking with the city there's a table where we're at we bring our expertise uh, madam speaker so we will continue to defend the interests of the residents of scarborough as well as our collaboration with the interests of all uh, you know opportunity for transit i will say this speaker it was i who moved the motion to bring the DRL line that was actually not in the 25-year plan or the 10-year horizon plan for uh, Metrolinx. And there are people now today in this council who are very supportive of it who did not support it when I moved it back then. And that was from someone from Scarborough. So we were looking at the interests of everyone in terms of transit. So I'm supportive of providing the mayor with the direction that he needs Thank you, to uh, deal with the province. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Okay, our first motion is motion number two, if we can put it on the screen. No. Sorry, we're finished. Councillor Peruzza, that was the end of speakers, sorry. You, you, you didn't have your name up there. Motion number two. Okay, recorded vote. Well, you put it up after when we started voting. Well, you've been sitting here, you could have put your name up. Well, when you want a separate Councilor vote, Peruzza, then your you vote, want... please. No. If members, if members of council want to speak on an item, they should put their name up, like you know, on the list. Well, Councilor Carroll, Councilor Peruzza, please. Councilor Bradford, please. Councilor Carroll, Councilor Peruzza, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 8 to 18. Motion 1B. Recorded vote. The motion carries 25 to 1. Motion 5. <clears throat> Recorded vote. The motion carries 22 to 4. Motion 1A as amended. Recorded vote. Yeah, but I told you, I told you you need to tell me before we start taking the vote, not in the middle of the vote. No, you didn't. Councillor I Peruzza, said to you, please. when we get to the motion, let me know in advance. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Bradford, please. But he didn't tell me which one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
The motion carries 23 to 3. Okay, our next, next motion. Okay, Councillor Matlow, when you got up before we started voting, you indicated that you wanted some of the motions split up. I said, fine, when we get, the mo when we get to the motion before we start voting, tell me which motion. And you did not tell me that. I'm just, sorry. Just to be clear, I yeah. did. What I said yeah. is not my motion, but all the recommendations from the committee and from the from, from. Okay, our next motion, if you can put it on the screen. <clears throat> 3A, recorded vote. <coughs> Councillor Carroll, please. Motion carries 25 to 1. Motion 3B. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Fletcher, please. The motion carries unanimously 26 in favor. Motion four. Recorded vote. <laughs> Recorded vote. Councillor Karagiannis, please. The motion carries 18 to 8. So, Councillor Matlow, we're at the uh, committee report. How do you want it split up? I'm asking you now. See, Councillor Matlow, it's not, it's very difficult. So can we tell Councillor Matlow
All right, so um, what we can do is in the executive committee report, if I can have everyone please listen, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Pasternak. So we're going to have, in the, ex in the executive report, 1A will be voted on separately. So let's vote on 1A. It's highlighted on the screen. Recorded vote. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor. The recommendation 1A carries 22 to 4. Okay, I item as amended, recorded vote. The balance, yeah. Recorded vote. Councillor Bailao, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. The balance of the item as amended carries 25 to 1. Okay. Well, I was, who knows, who knows, <laughs> who knows, like, uh, anyway, so our next item, timed item, is on page three, uh, PH 4.1, Don Mills Crossing, final report, Councilor Robinson held the item down, and can we remove, um, there's a name, uh, Councilor Karajanis, what is your name up there for? Okay, Councillor Robinson, you have questions? Um, it was a timed item. No, I don't think I have any questions. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Okay, Councillor Robinson, do you want to speak? Yes, Madam, uh, I actually have a motion. Um, so we, we discussed this item at uh, Planning and Housing Committee I move this motion on behalf of uh, some of the members of the cycling community in that area. Or a motion similar to this, uh, staff have since met with me and said um, that maybe the motion that was moved was not ideal from a technical standpoint. So this corrects that, makes it a little more open-ended. And um, so I'm moving that. And uh, that's really it. Okay. This is so really staff's... So why yeah, and it's staff's, it's, staff's, um, it's staff's idea to just uh, alter the wording a bit here from what was moved at committee. So why was it a timed item? Oh, okay. So that's it? Okay, so you have your amendment. Um, Deputy Mayor Men Wong, did you have a question to Councillor Robinson? Yes, would the Councillor be uh, accepted as a friendly, a friendly amendment to add it also in consultation with the local Councillor? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Deputy Mayor Minnewonk to speak. Um, uh, I ha sorry, did the, cl did the clerk's office, yeah, you can add that? Oh, very nimble the clerk's office is. Um, I have a, an amendment. Okay. So. The, the amendment makes the motion, the recommendation number eight reads, City Council request the Chief Planner, Executive Director, City Planning to review the opportunity to incorporate a food bank and or mm. community kitchen in the multi-purpose non-profit community space. Okay. I only changed that within the context of a committee. Okay. Council Robinson moved a motion identifying one particular group 
to have control over this, uh, the city property, and I don't believe one particular group. There's actually widespread need and interest in this, so I've basically made it more um, agnostic, not, not favoring one group over another group. That's all. And otherwise, I support the uh, report. Okay. Okay, Councillor Robinson. So, would you consider it a friendly amendment to say also to, to include the community share food bank in the in the mix because uh, they are a member agency of the North York Harvest and, and Second Harvest Agency. They've been in place since 2004. They're one of the biggest food banks in Toronto, quite frankly, but they they work very quietly behind the scenes. So. Um, would you be willing to say including the community food, uh, the sh community share food bank, including them as one of the potential um, uh, agencies to be involved in this? So, Ma Madam Chair, I, um, what I would say is this: we're kind of getting into the weeds on something that's the secondary plan, which is supposed to be more of a, you know, a, um, a, a thirty-five thousand foot document. It's not supposed to get into this level of minutia. Number one, although. You know, the motion was moved to committee and, and the, and the ch Councillor Chair Bylaw accepted that. Number two, um, uh, the other reason why I wouldn't accept it is I think we need to keep it sort of neutral because, uh, you know, there are a lot of groups in Flemington that want to use this and I would like to add them as well and I don't want to favor one group over another group. I just don't think it's, that's right and proper and as the local councillor for this area, I think we should just leave it, we, we should just keep it not mentioning any particular group. So no, I wouldn't accept that. Yeah, I guess I would ask you, are you aware that this food bank's in the functioning out of the basement of a church and which the church has limited, uh, limited lifespan. So really they need some type of long-term, well, m really short-term plan on how to continue to function to serve families in the Don Mills community and beyond. Yes, yeah, so I met with the group. I'm aware of their concerns. I'm also, I've also met with other community groups in Flemington and Don Mills, and I'm aware of that. I'm, I think we share the common interest of trying to incorporate this. This is, in some ways, a, a discussion that should be, take place in another forum, perhaps at, when this comes to the Executive Committee or comes to the Parks and Recreation Committee. We're not... So the, the existing plan does not really include that right now for the Don Mills, the, the, the Celestica Community Centre. In fact, um, Madam Chair, we haven't even decided yet on the particular site, and now we're deciding which groups are going to use it. So I w would say to members of Council, it's exceedingly premature to be dealing with this level of detail at this particular time when that decision has not even been made yet, and this, it hasn't been even present, presented to this Council. Thank you. Okay, um, last speaker, Councillor Carroll. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, it's, it's awkward to, to go after the local councillor on this, but I just, I just wanted to uh, uh, shed a little light on, on this because many of us are where we have large site applications trying to incorporate uh, uh, kitchens of a grade such that they could be used in a sort of a community kitchen capacity and a food bank capacity. What we've just gone through in the Park by Forest Community Recreation Centre, where we built a full commercial grade kitchen, is the, the, uh, the extremely complicated process of qualifying a group to, to, main, to make sure that they have the capacity to be using uh, uh, these kitchens and leave no liability for our own corporations. It may well turn out that exactly the, the group that Councillor Robinson hopes will will get this uh, will get this with a partner like North York Harvest it's likely but I think it's important to note that recreation has a very robust process to make sure that as they go in they are safe their users are safe and that there is a fair usage of that kitchen by this group and others by being able to go through that process once the kitchen exists and so I just wanted to uh, 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 reinforce what Councillor Minna Wong has said, that really if we want to make sure that all of these kitchens don't leave us with difficult anomalies throughout the system as we begin to build more and more of them through development, that it's really best to leave that process with recreation and social development staff. And, uh, and then we, we, you know, if we, if we have a passion for a group and we know that group has a need, 
at that time, we can advocate for them and help them have that capacity to get through the process. So uh, I'll be supportive of Councilman Wong's motion. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's put the motions on the screen. Okay. On favor? Carried. Recorded vote. Councillor Layton, please, and thank you. Councillor Thompson. The amendment carries unanimously 24 in favor. Okay, the next, uh, the next motion. All in favor? Recorded vote. <laughs> Councillor Bradford, Councillor Matlow, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. The amendment carries 22 to 2. Item is amended on favor. Carried. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carroll, can you come up? Um, so we're going to go back to our item uh, for speakers on page 3, EC 3.6, the noise bylaw review. If we can put the speakers list on the screen, that's our next item. We, we, we completed the questions. We're just going into speakers now. Okay. okay. Councillor Cressy, you held the item, so you're first. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I'll begin by placing a motion, if clerks can put it on the screen. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak briefly to the motion and then broaden the comments. Uh, the second part of the motion is very self explanatory. Under the current um, bylaws, the city follows the provincial guidelines for air conditioners and the decibel limit. Uh, we can't implement and look at our own, and so this is a request to the province to let us look at that. The, this, the first part is the more significant one, so let me explain it. Prior to the updated noise bylaw that's in front of us here, there was what's called a general prohibition on noise except when there was construction or a permit. And so what that meant in effect was that any time you could hear noise, they, it was not allowed. Now, staff have brought forward an update to that, which is to allow non-construction noise at certain hours up to a certain decibel point. And the reason they've done that is, first of all, to acknowledge that there is some noise in the city, but more importantly, I think, to provide a tool to monitor and enforce it. So what is this motion? Is instead of having a general prohibition, we now have, have something called unreasonable and persistent noise. But let me give you an example of unreasonable and persistent noise that, that currently would be allowed based on the decibel limit. 
Say you live in a row house or a, de or a semi or a condo and say your neighbor plays electronic dance music with a bass from morning till night. That electronic dance music with a bass may not surpass the decibel limit. So it may be allowed, but it would be unreasonable and persistent to wake up every single day and have electronic dance music coming through your condo, your apartment, your house, wherever. Uh, and this is something, if you li live next to Councillor Bradford, you already have to put up with this every day because he plays electronic dance music morning till night, I know. And <laughs> but seriously, what this does, the motion, is to give staff direction to, um, to at their discretion, decide... Kenny Rogers, that's right. You got to know when to hold them. Um, but it gives staff the discretion to say that noise may be allowed under the decibel limit, but it is unreasonable and persistent, and it is to strengthen that bylaw to give them that direction. So that's what that is. Now let me broaden my comments at a much broader level. Um, for years and years and years, our staff in the MLS and in public health uh, have been working around the noise bylaw. And our residents, and I can tell you in downtown, uh, have been very active in this conversation. And active because, on the one hand, this is a quality of life issue, and it is also a public health issue. But it is as complex as it gets, and I think the questions we had demonstrated that. There is noise from construction, nightlife vehicles, leaf blowers and ACs, from dogs. And so, from a downtown point of view, downtown has been designed as a mixed-use neighborhood. So it is not an entertainment district where you should expect noise 24 hours a day, nor is it a sleepy hollow devoid of any sound. There is a balance there that needs to be struck. And the existing system does not work. The existing system does not allow for proper monitoring and certainly not for proper enforcement. And so in our attempt to find a balance and to update our noise bylaw, we haven't got it perfect. I don't believe we ever will. Um, but we are trying to strengthen the monitoring and enforcement level while recognizing that balance of the city. And my motion here, very clearly, is to while we are removing the general prohibition, it is to give staff the direction and the capacity to still tackle unreasonable and persistent noise when it is necessary. And so with that, I will conclude my remarks by thanking our city staff for years and years and years of work and a lot of meetings with my office on this, but also the many members of the public, stakeholders from various industries, but really residents in my community in downtown who have been working tirelessly on this for three years. Uh, and with that, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cressy. Councillor Cressy, I have a question for you from Councillor Pasternak. Sure. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, through you, could this, could your motion result in the yanking of um, window-mounted air conditioners from TCH buildings? No. You're sure? Yes. That was uh, that was uh, suitably brief. Thank you, Councilor Pasternak. <laughs> Uh, that's the only question I have for you, Councillor uh, Cressy. Councillor Matlow, you are next. Uh, th thank you. I have a, a motion to uh, defer the item for two cycles, and, uh, and I'll explain to you why, uh, why I'm pr uh, proposing this. Uh, uh, after I uh, uh, first thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Councillor Cressy and uh, Layden, Wong Tam, when she was right in the middle of it all, uh, and others who have been involved in this discussion. Um, this, this, I also want to, by the way, thank uh, staff who, um, you know, along with uh, Tracy Cook before him and uh, Carlton Grant and uh, Mark and everybody as part of the MLS team, they do an amazing job. And, uh, you know, they work with, uh, I think, far too little at times to do so much. The expectations on them are boundless. We keep adding expectations onto them, and they really do a good job with what they can. But as I said in my, or I, I, I alluded to in my questioning uh, yesterday, um, 
every time a resident of, of any of your wards uh, call 311 with a complaint, um, they are told that within five days somebody is going to be able to come and investigate. And in, in, this, in this case, I'm speaking to a construction noise complaint, for example. And uh, by the time that somebody can come by in those cases, uh, the problem wasn't addressed when it needed to be addressed within a timely manner. And also there was no way to be able to uh, get the kind of evidence that one would need to successfully prosecute. This is a challenge for residents because uh, they have expectations that we have a noise bylaw and therefore it should be enforced. And it's a challenge for our staff because they in no way, as, as uh, Carlton said yesterday, can respond to every single complaint that comes in through 311. Uh, but, you know, and, and they have to triage based on what they can address and what they can't. So we're hearing from the Toronto Noise Coalition, for example, where they say, you know, a lot of good work's been done, there has been progress, but there are some specific issues that have not been addressed. In other words, uh, this is baking, but it's not ready to come out of the oven. And these are some of the most engaged people in this conversation. And if we're trying to get to the finish line with them, then let's do it with them rather than leave them feeling like this isn't a good package. Uh, what I'm very clear about is that it should be no more than two months. In other words, they're saying specifically two months to really just get this right. And then no matter what, with, after two months, whatever happens, something needs to move on. And I get that. Pragmatically, rationally, we need some bylaw in effect that's an improvement. Uh, what I'm concerned about, though, that is that if we haven't also completed most of the hiring, we don't have enforcement, again, as I said yesterday, the other side of the coin in place, and we're going to be setting up new expectations, uh, uh, then, you know, we need, to, we need to be realistic about what we can even address. I actually think that there's, if I had it my way, there'd be many, many other reforms I'd like to see in this package too. Um, so over the next two months, hopefully, we can address their concerns. We also heard, by the way, and this isn't something that I support necessarily, but we heard from the Toronto Region, the Toronto Region Board of Trade. Even they've expressed concerns. I think Councillor Thompson raised it yesterday about councillors' ability to intervene with noise, noise bylaw exemptions with respect to concrete pours. And, um, you know, they're expressing their concerns too. Let's get them back to the table too. You know, maybe there's another way to address the need for concrete not to be stopped as concrete is being poured because it, I get it, it hardens, but also to make sure that there's a mitigation plan in place no matter what, maybe even initially through the zoning. Uh, I don't know what that answer is, but let's discuss that. Point being, this is almost ready to come out of the oven. It's not quite ready to come out of the oven. And what I'm urging you to do, uh, especially those of us who kind of deal, I mean, I deal with noise bylaw uh, complaints all the time. I can't tell you, I don't remember a Saturday morning that I've woken up that without a tweet or, or, or an email at me saying, you know, some contractor thought it would be a great idea at five in the morning to start, you know, hammering away. Most of us have experienced in that, experienced that if you, if you represent the downtown or midtown areas along with other areas of our city where there's construction. So two more months, that's the request from our communities. Let's nail this down one way or another and then move on. But what I'm concerned about is that if we don't allow this, what we're gonna end up is with a revised bylaw and a bunch of unhappy people who are the very people who are actually trying to kind of bring, bring us forward with rather than leave behind. And I think a lot of people are going to feel that way if we don't do this with them. So two months, and then we get going. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have a question for you, Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, I, I'm just, when you say two months, yeah. uh, you know, you're saying two meeting cycles, and with the best of intentions, you know how that sometimes sort of gets punted along. Are you not concerned? that that now takes us into the busy construction season and the busy party season uh, with the status quo, which is people are not happy with now. What, um, what I'm cons the reason that I kept going back to the enforcement side is that no matter if we move things by two hours or this or that, um, I'm actually not convinced that even with, with the bylaw reforms, that will actually on the ground, like in real life experience, feel much change if the complaints are not addressed within a reasonable time frame. And I think one of, the, one, of, one of the reasons for my request for the two months, along with responding to Kathy McDonald and the Toronto Noise Coalition, 
is also um, at our last, uh, and thank you for asking because I, I wanted to mention this. During our last licensing committee meeting, I asked the very same question about where they're at with hiring. And what staff said is actually really soon, they're going to be in a place where they're going to be forced up more. They're going to have more staff. They're going to, they've actually got announcements to come where they're going to be able to do things in a different way that could make our communities a lot happier. And I think this, if this comes forward in the same way at the same time, it'll be a better delivery. So that's what I'm hoping for. But okay, um, I just want clarification here. So there's a deferral motion, and I see everybody's names up now. Uh, um, I, are you, is yeah, I was just, I thought I was starting the no, question. No, call. so we're like debating the, like speaking on the deferral. Yes, but, but what I'm doing is asking questions of the mover. I think people are confused about which column to be in. Yeah, so Tom Thompson, are you asking, are you? <laughs> so you're asking, asking questions, not speaking on the deferral. Okay, I just wanted okay. to get it straight because. Uh, that, that's in questions of staff calling. Two, it's two minutes. Uh, seeing, seeing the other questioners, I, I, I suspect my next question will be asked by another councillor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Thompson, two uh, minutes. Thank you very much, you very much uh, Madam Speaker. And I have my name in the right column, not confused at all. So um, through you, uh, with respect to your deferral, Councillor, um, the Noise Coalition and others have put forward a variety of um, concerns that they've had. Yeah. Staff have within the span of two weeks that we had agreed to that they would be able to respond to them, responded to the concerns in question. What additional concerns have they brought to your attention that they need additional time to be addressed? Uh, I'll just make a few uh, note, yeah, notes. Uh, they've, uh, so uh, addressing so the, the staff is obviously yeah. taking notes as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've brought up everything from um, how to how to meaningfully address motorcycle noise, replace the use. Well, wasn't of, that addressed yesterday in the question? Yeah, yeah, it was addressed yeah. in the questions, but I, because it's the after mar market. Uh, and we'll see, by the way, and we'll, and we'll see what happens with the votes and right. all that. But I just mean sure. Okay. As delivery to council. Uh, yeah. by this meeting, Fair it wasn't enough. resolved, right? Yeah. Um, looking at uh, the best ways to measure uh, amplified uh, noise. Um, uh, looking for a clear definition as to, um, uh, as to what at source means with, uh, with uh, the requirement for me the measurement for amplified sound. Um, uh, they want to look at retaining the regulation to allow measurement of the property line for amplified sound. There's a number of kind of specific detailed issues. But those uh, were addressed during the consultation with staff and as the best that they could. So I'm just yeah. wondering in terms of getting to a resolution, how will we get there since they've already gone through those? There's, I mean, as, as you know, there's a difference between addressed and resolved. And clearly, and staff will, will tell you this too, not everything's been resolved. And their position has been crystal clear that they're sort of, they're at a point where they feel like they've gone as far as they can in the road. Now it's time to just kind of okay. do it, right? Um, and I respect that. I mean, they've done an amazing job. Uh, they're really good at what they do. What we're hearing from residents at the table, though, is that, and again, you know how it is at a table. There's more than one voice. There's more than one perspective. What the residents are saying is that they actually would like to work on these specific issues because they're important to them. I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in amplified noise, so I'm not going to give you the you. answer. Thank uh, you. But they'd like to work on that. Thank yeah. you. It's only two minutes. Councillor Baila. Thank you. Through you, Madam Speaker. Um, Councillor, you are aware that staff have been working with different councillors and the communities for a few years now on this, correct? Yeah, including, including myself and my community. They, yeah. they, they, they're great. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just wondering that um, if uh, you would consider that uh, if this is a proof that they, we continue to monitor this and work with the communities because huh? we know that these are very complex issues and uh, you know getting to hundred percent satisfaction all the time might not be possible but acknowledging that we need to continue to work with the communities but that we also need to move ahead with some sort of enforcement and bylaw would would you agree with that I, I, I fully agree um, all the point of, of this motion is that what we are hearing from the most in, some of the most engaged residents who have been at the table, that they're appreciative of the work that staff have done, they feel like they have made progress, 
that there are specific issues, some of which I addressed, uh, referring to the letter from uh, the Toronto East Coalition, that they would like to uh, have, you know, rather than you know, uh, uh, it, it, it approved today, a small window of additional time to see if they can resolve them. I can tell you my position is clear that this can't go on forever. I think that they've asked for two months. Let's give them two months. If we can't arrive uh, anywhere further in two months, then one thing or another will have to happen. But um, I don't think that anyone loses by, uh, by saying, okay, we on at least the you know, staff side of the table are going to do everything possible within reason to resolve every single one of those outstanding items with an understanding that after two months, if they aren't, then one thing or another has to happen. Yeah. But, but don't you feel that that process already took place? I, I, um, I feel well, from... No, I mean, specific, the, the, yes, there was a long process with a lot of work put into it, but not this uh, request. This request is for one last shot, two months, to be able to address and resolve these outstanding issues. And when you asked about, do I believe that the enforcement is, is a critical side of it? Not one. Okay, that, that was it. Yeah, just, yeah. just two minutes. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, what I'm hearing from people like Kathy, from others as part of the coalition, is they also recognize that this can't go on forever. No one's saying that like no good work's been done. I mean, it's evident that it has. Thank you. They just want to. If, if they just have one last shot, I think then they Councilor will be happy with you. whatever the result is. Thank you, Councillor Holliday. Two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, through you to Councillor Matlow. What precisely are the things that you want to try to resolve? I did see the letter from the Toronto Noise Coalition. Is it exactly what they've asked Council about? There's one, two, three, four, five specifics. Yeah, they, they've, they've listed uh, uh, their, uh, I think very clearly, their points of, of contention. Some of which, by the way, may be resolved in the matter of this uh, meeting. Some may not. Um, what is what, what they are being very clear about, though, is that they don't mean to hold it up any further than that. They just want to be able to resolve them. So would you not uh, consider or agree that at some point you actually need to try out what the proposals are of the staff in order to evaluate whether or not they've been successful and able to compare to some of the recommendations that the coalition have? For instance, uh, I know one of the, the things that the coalition brought up was this notion of LEQ versus DBZ. And so we've got different uh, standards that are proposed by our staff, and we wouldn't know if they're successful until we've had a chance to try them out. So um, the, the Toronto Noise Coalition, they actually came in with even a bigger ask, right? They, they wanted to go with the New York approach, which is far more vigorous, far more enforcement, and they've, they've compromised on a number of, of points. They're not convinced that the direction the staff are going in uh, is satisfactory. And what, what I'm doing, and you know, agree or disagree with right. me, uh, is uh, you know, basically uh, in a representative democracy, what I'm doing is reflecting those concerns today. And, uh, and I'm hearing it from Kathy, I'm hearing it from a number of members of the community that have been engaged in this discussion. And I just want to allow them that opportunity to come back to the table for one last uh, uh, chance. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. Two minutes. Councillor Perks on the deferral. Two minutes. Thank you, Speaker. Um, it's my intention to oppose the deferral, and I encourage all of my colleagues to join me in that. While I, I want to acknowledge the very important work that the uh, Toronto Noise Coalition and all the, their member organizations uh, have done and will continue to do on this. I think it is it is time to fish or cut bait. We we have I can tell you that the entire time I have been an elected official, there have been efforts to fine tune, tweak, amend, change, update, uh, and sometimes uh, tear it all up and start all over again to our noise bylaw. It's an enormously complex uh, regulatory piece. It's enormously complex enforcement piece. It's also very difficult to communicate with constituents about what their rights are and how they apply in a given circumstance. We need to settle something, get it in place, and make improvements. It, for every communication I have had from a community group concerned about uh, whether this final form of what we've got is perfect, I have a hundred other 
communications from constituents who are suffering right now and need improvements. And I'm not going to delay those improvements. As to the suggestion that we can just put this off for two months and come back, no, you can't. The bylaw is complex, the monitoring is complex, the equipment you need is complex, the hiring is complex. If you put it off for two months and move one piece, everything else has to move too, and we will lose a year. I'm not prepared to do that. The time to print the ticket and get a, uh, a better noise bylaw in place is now. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak on the deferral, two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I am against deferral. Staff have been working on this for years. Uh, the staff report in front of us stretches uh, 31 pages. Uh, they did online surveys. They hosted various uh, town halls. Between January and February of this year, they had five public consultations. They received over 300 written submissions. The bylaws were last comprehensively updated in 2010. They retain an acoustical engineering firm, a third-party opinion a research firm, and a third-party participation firm. They have done the work, they have been comprehensive, and the people of Toronto wanted us to get on with the business of running the city and not delay, delay, delay. This is time to get this, this package done. It's not perfect, you can always come back for future amendments. But to delay uh, uh, another important policy piece in front of us is setting a bad signal out to the people of Toronto that we are unable to govern and unable to make decisions. Staff have done remarkable work on this piece. It's time to support it. Thank you. On the deferral recorded vote. Councillor Bailao, please. The motion to defer does not carry. The vote is 7 to 15. Okay. Um, count, yes, just a sec. Councillor Kergianis. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, on a point of order, I rise to introduce a uh, a cl two classrooms from uh, my area, St. Sylvester School. They've been here at beyond the uh, beyond the classroom, and they're accompanied by Mr. Fernandez, the principal, Miss Ironside, which is a grade two, three teacher, Miss Severino, which is grade three and four, and we do also have a parent, Mrs. Mandaka. Thank you for uh, for coming down. You should hire that guy's accountant. Thank you. Hey. Councillor Bailao to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do have a motion that I'd like to uh, put on the screen, if possible. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking staff and many of my colleagues and their offices that have been for many uh, years now uh, working on the noise bylaw. I think, as you will see, there's uh, uh, small amendments coming, uh, and I think that uh, there's there's a point that was made with. Uh, the possible deferral is that this is a complex issue and that we always need to continue working with our communities on this to make sure that we're improving uh, the quality of life for everybody. But on this uh, issue of continuous concrete pouring, I wanted to bring your attention that we have a real tough balance to attain in here. We have, I think, the last number that I saw was 104 cranes up in the air in the City of Toronto. It's more than New York, Chicago and LA put together. 
There's a lot of construction, which is good. You know, our city is growing, jobs are out there. Uh, we need to build homes for these people. But obviously, sometimes this becomes inconvenient for a lot of people. And this is the balance that we need to get in here. It's the balance between making sure that we're building the homes that we so desperately need in the city and making sure that we are respecting the neighbors that live be, uh, beside what today is a construction site, but tomorrow, tomorrow is going to be somebody's home, is going to be somebody's house. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to get in here, because like in any other industry, we have good operators and we have not so good operators. So the ones that are really good, they're doing the best they can to accommodate uh, you know, really tough construction sites. Other ones, not so good. And that's what we're trying to do in here, is to bring those two parts together. And finally, you know, for I think the first time um, since I've been a counselor, you know, we all bring a lot of experience and conversations we have at the dinner table. I'm able to bring my experience and conversations at the dinner table because this is what my dad do for a living. He was a cement finisher. So there's no better person, I think, in this council chamber that understands everything and anything about cement finishing than I. And I know that very often he would have to call us saying, you know what? Don't expect me at night because we're, there's cement pouring and we have to finish the work. So not that he really enjoyed it, not that he boss enjoyed paying a time and a half to finish the work, but they had to do it because there's a big truck, a big load of expensive cement outside that needs to get finished. So what we're trying to do in here is create a process where some noise mitigation is going to be accommodated, but that... Uh, this work can, when uh, in extenuating circumstan circumstances needs to happen, that it happens with the uh, acknowledgement, with the conscious effort to, um, to, uh, to mitigate the, uh, the issues with the community. So I ask for your support. And uh, Madam Speaker, I ask that uh, we get some silence in the chambers as well. Thank you. And so I ask for the, the uh, support of uh, my colleagues for this. I think that we need to fine tune what staff has proposed, and I think that with my motion we'll be able to get that, uh, uh, that balance so much needed. Thank you. Um, we do have a question by Councillor Philly in three minutes. Um, thank you. Councillor Bylaw, could you go through each component and elaborate on what you're changing from the staff recommendations and what's the effect of what you're changing it to? Yes, I don't have a, co a copy, so I'll ask staff to put the motion on the screen. So, uh, so we are removing the definition of continuous pouring concrete and uh, large crane work, so to allow a process to be created to have these exemptions. So we're, we're right now we have a blank blanket exemption. We're getting rid of that blanket exemption and saying that there's a process that is going to be created to have that exemption. But what would, I don't, what would the process be? So that's, that's coming in the next point. Okay, thank you. So the other thing is that staff had recommended that every three months they, they would need to come in and, and uh, apply for that permit. Well, we know that construction lasts sometimes more than three months and that it is appropriate that they come with a plan if, if they want it for a one year, that they, they can, if so wish, to present the plan for six months, eight months, one year. The, the number three is actually what is required to have that exemption. If you can scroll uh, up a bit so we can actually see the points under, under number three. So uh, we will need to have this uh, notice of exemption permit uh, installed. So most of this was already in the report. We're just emphasizing here in the, in the, uh, in the motion. So these are conditions that, um, that staff had recommended already. So if you have a... With the exception, I think, with the 120 meters. That we actually, uh, I worked with some other colleagues on this, and these are things that we added. The notice for residents within 120 meters, that was actually not recommended in the report. We, add, we added that. So the residents are notified, but, and I'll pick a real example, um, where um, concrete work or crane work is being proposed um, on a... Friday afternoon of a Jewish holiday as people are uh, gathering for dinner. And in the past, I've been able to say, 
yes, you can do the work, but you cannot do it at that time. Um, and staff will be able to do that. So they will have to, to give the plan and what mitigations and what they're doing, and it has to be approved by our staff. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion. Thanks, here. And it is a motion for a report in the future. Um, I hope that this is not a contentious ask, uh, but it is asking uh, to have a follow-up in a year's time, so Q4 of 2020. And I'll take note, the reason why it's Q4 is so that we can go through a summer period uh, where um, our MLS staff are fully operational with this new bylaw and out in the field and just see how it goes. I've just added a list of things that I could seem to predict might be items of interest. I'll put it to councillors if you've got any other ideas, you know, make them known. Uh, and I've left it open for any additional reporting. Uh, but I'll take note, this is, a, this is a big deal, this change. Everyone knows in this chamber, either through their personal experiences uh, as a citizen of the city or in their role as a, uh, a member of council that noise is a sensitive matter. It is often complex and it is often something that is extremely difficult to resolve. I believe that the report coming forward adds new tools um, to the, to the uh, tool set that MLS has to try and get these matters fixed. Um, what I would really like to see is how they work. And I am optimistic. Uh, a lot of work has been done on this. Um, having new measurement technologies and things to try to quantify and deal with a matter on the spot, I think will go a long way because we've all lived through that where residents have been asked to gather tons and tons of evidence on a noise log to see if we can figure out what it is and go before a JP and explain why there's an impact. At least now we can say, you know, you're above or below the threshold and it's much clearer. And if that doesn't work, there's still some pr processes under the new bylaw to try and resolve matters that are even more complex in nature. Uh, but I want to see how that works. And one particular thing I want to look at closely is, you know, what happens with music in a neighborhood. Um, before there were general provisions that basically said you can't play music late at night, but very difficult to enforce. In our case, we're now going to have a, a sound test on that. Um, but I still want to understand if that was adequate, because if it's a really quiet neighborhood, is that enough to deal with the matter? Uh, so the report back would come uh, at the end of next year, and uh, I hope members of council uh, see this uh, as a suitable way to uh, deal with the matters maybe that Councillor Matlow raised um, in his request to defer. He wanted to work on this some more. I think at some point we should get on with the, the changes, see how they went, and if there's anything that needs to be dealt with in a year's time, we will deal with that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fillion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have an amendment that City Council amend Part 43.C of Economic and Community Development Committee Recommendation 1 by adding the words, except for non-emergency work conducted by the City of Toronto and its agencies or corporations between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 p.m. so that it now reads as follows government work except for non-emergency work conducted by the City of Toronto and its agencies or corporations between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. So um, this is uh, hopefully a very small amendment to simply say we should not be giving ourselves um, a blanket exemption to create noise overnight that would literally keep people awake all night. So um, for emergency work, sure, you have to go in and do the work whenever you can. Um, at other times, we should be um, certainly, if at all possible, um, doing the work so that it does not keep um, people awake. The, the whole purpose of this exercise, um, I had hoped, was to reduce um, the noise that our residents are subjected to the single biggest source of noise in the area that I represent <laughs> and probably the same elsewhere in the city um, is work done by the City of Toronto, not work done by the development industry. So for example, every time a condo is built, there are utility cuts um, across Young Street and those have to be repaired. Those are now repaired by the 
city of Toronto, Young Street is being dig up, dug up uh, pretty well perpetually. There's always somebody doing some kind of digging. And um, now with the current regulations where the city of Toronto is not exempt, the staff have to come in and ask for an exemption and that provides an opportunity to have a discussion about you know what's the level of noise how can we schedule this in a way so that we yes get it done faster yes don't add to the cost uh, yes uh, do not disrupt uh, traffic more than necessary but also do not keep people awake at night more than is necessary so we really shouldn't be doing a, a do as we um, say not as we do here and uh, the city of Toronto should not be giving itself an exemption to keep people awake all night there may be situations where um, work can be done without keeping people awake but um, we should only do that where absolutely necessary um, ironically this situation occurs most where you have the most people living along a major street because the uh, for example in Willowdale there would be easily 50,000 people living uh, right along Young Street and that's it it's largely due to that population increase and all the various construction activity that we are continually digging up the street and doing more um, city work so um, I think we really need to be sensitive to residents here and uh, continue to allow our, ourselves to have those discussions with staff and not just find out when a notice is issued that um, or when we get the complaints that people are being kept awake all night. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor Cressy, clarification of the motion. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Could the motion be put on the screen as it hasn't been distributed yet? Uh, so, so I understand this. Uh, there is, under your motion, there is still the possibility for uh, government work to take place after hours, but rather there would need to be a process to permit it. Is that correct? Yeah, well, first of all, if it's emergency work, the motion only applies to non-emergency work. Okay. If it's emergency work, obviously, it has to be done whatever the time is. If it's non-emergency work um, and uh, staff are proposing that it be done between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., there would need to be a discussion about it. So, and I think just... To, to make sure I understand that, because I have the gardener in a big chunk of my ward where we deal with this a lot. So what you're saying is that if there was a desire to do non-emergency government work, there would need to be a process to look at that rather than just assuming that it will take place overnight. That's right. A conversation with the councillor is usually okay. what's required. And, and uh, in my experience, there's never any work that's not been done it's just you come up with an alternate plan that uh, meets everybody's needs. Okay, that, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, could your motion stretch out the uh, length of the construction project due to this, due to the restricted hours? Well, uh, that hypothetical question, could that be possible in some rare instance? It's possible again in, in my experience it uh, hasn't been in fact in um, you know one case very recently having to do with uh, Young Street the project was reduced from 10 weeks to three to four weeks and uh, with a financial saving of a million dollars so um, it, it you know uh, recently, um, and, and you would be aware of this, uh, Councillor Pasternak, on Bathurst Street, there was discussions on um, how we can do the work that's planned there um, by Enbridge in a in a way that doesn't uh, doesn't slow down the project and doesn't keep people awake all night. Right, um, but you're you're restricting the hours of construction, so that sends a signal to residents that the construction period will. Well, will current, last longer. Currently, 
currently um, the city is not at all exempt from the uh, noise bylaw period except for emergency work. The staff are recommending removing that exemption so that, so that if we adopt the staff recommendations, council will be giving the city the uh, ability to, as of right, um, make whatever construction noise it wants, whatever it wants to make it. I don't think that's a reasonable thing for the city to be uh, doing. So theoretically, this motion could increase construction costs because you're shrinking the ability to work, is that? No, well, it's increasing the ability to work from what it is now. Currently, um, it is seven to seven is the, um, is the current bylaw. So this actually extends it three <coughs> hours from what we have now. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam to speak. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I would like to move a uh, motion, and that is to amend Councillor Bailao's motion by simply adding the words with overnight event and activity discourage. Uh, so, therefore, her motion now. Uh, asking for the noise mitigation strategy from the applicant, asking for the noise exemption. Uh, when they apply for that noise exemption, uh, they would be discouraged from applying for overnight activity uh, and any type of events. Um, and that largely has uh, speaks to uh, large crane work or perhaps overnight continuous pours. What we want to do is encourage the applicants to begin that work early in the day so that hopefully they can complete it before uh, the evening. Um, so I believe that's a friendly amendment and I had the opportunity to consult with the councillor before moving that. Um, I want to thank staff for this um, remarkable volume of work. I don't think that the, the report before us even begin to summarize the, the amount of active listening and engagement that they had to undertake in order for them to lead this um, bylaw review. Uh, Toronto Municipal Code Chapter 591. It's, uh, it's something that we speak about lots in our office, uh, especially as a downtown office. Um, and in 2013, I moved a motion asking for a review of this bylaw, recognizing that it had not been uh, actively and broadly reviewed since 2012. What I did not anticipate, my staff did not anticipate, is that it would take three years until 2016 when the staff would be able to turn their heads to, the, uh, to uh, conducting the strategy for consultation and then, uh, and then take underway uh, the broad, um, uh, deep analysis that was required. They had to get into some very technical things that they were not accustomed to doing. And I think that what's before us now, uh, 17 years uh, since the last time the bylaw, uh, the noise bylaw was actively reviewed and majorly overhauled, uh, we have a, a uh, a series of recommendations that gives us a lot more power. And the things that we have, and, and I should also thank my staff, uh, former staff Sheila Pardo, who's actually now crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it was actually her original motion. She was dealing with uh, motorcycle noise in the village of Yorkville, which is kind of what kicked it off. Then we started to get an avalanche of complaints around construction uh, noise, especially for those operators that were beginning construction before 7 p.m. Um, and then Lorraine Hewitt from my office, who has been so patient and steadfast in, in monitoring the activity and responding to uh, constituents within our community and then outside of our community to make sure that people felt that they were actively heard um, and, uh, and that their comments were well received. Um, interestingly enough, I think it's important for us, Madam Speaker, for us to recognize uh, what was not here in 2002. Uh, what was not in this bylaw in 2002 was the authority to request noise monitoring. Um, which is now here. In 17 years later, in the 2019 uh, bylaw, uh, the new bylaw proposed before us, is now the request for noise mitigation plans. These are things that we were, did not have the authority and we did not pursue. We, are, we will now have those powers. We also have the powers to exempt permits. Uh, we've always been able to do that. Uh, for, uh, for some applications, but there was never the, the authority to do that uh, more broadly. Uh, we are now able to proactively 
proactively, Madam Speaker, uh, mitigate noise. And where noise contravenes uh, what is permitted, uh, we will now see MLS increasing fines and penalty. So let's take a look at what those fines and penalties were uh, in the, uh, the old bylaw. In the old bylaw, if you contravene the noise um, uh, bylaw, you would be given a fine of about $155 to $305, and this would be through proactive enforcement. Developers and those who violated the noise bylaw saw it as a, as a cost of just doing business. They were going to tear it up, and the bylaw meant absolutely nothing to them. While the poor communities were asked through a very inefficient 311 system to document and write down in a paper log all the ways that this, um, this repeat offender was violating the noise bylaw. It was a system that was just broken, and we didn't have the powers to enforce. The new noise bylaw, what's proposed before us today, will see fines of up to $100,000. I would think that the, the general contractor, the project manager on that, on that development site is going to think twice, and that means that they're going to hold their third-party contractors to greater account. Uh, this bylaw is as good as it's going to get, and I believe that we should be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I have a motion that I was asked to, to move that City Council add a definition of living area to mean any area that includes the that includes the premises of a dwelling or a workspace. My understanding is it's a technical amendment that was was coming from staff. Yeah. Um, so I just quickly, I'd like to thank staff. I, the, the, my vote in favor of, of a deferral was in no way a reflection, or I hope it wasn't taken as a reflection, of uh, a lack of, of confidence in what's being moved forward, but instead an opportunity for us to uh, kind of tie together and knit together um, the, the, the community of support. On the one hand, we're getting, we're getting concerns from some of the neighbors, neighbor, uh, the neighbors that have been working very strongly on this, and perhaps some of it was a misunderstanding about how, uh, how uh, staff came to certain conclusions. Um, perhaps some of it was just a difference of opinion. On the other hand, we've got uh, industry uh, and, and the development community saying, hey, wait a second, I don't think you fully appreciate and understand uh, what, why and what a, um, uh, some, of, uh, some of the exemptions meant for those uh, communities and what would be added on to it. And so I, I ho had hoped that through a deferral, we would be given some time to make sure that as the, 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 these last revisions were made, that they were being done in a, in a more thoughtful process. Having said that, it's in front of us. I like the direction that staff have taken in this. Um, there are some motions here, though, that I think are critical. One, I think Councillor Cressy's motion uh, uh, helps bring us, at least in, in, in a very symbolic way, closer to what the community uh, wants reflected in, uh, in the noise bylaw. Uh, Councillor Bailao's uh, um, recommendation uh, addresses some of the issues around the continuous poor that both, both addresses the neighbors' uh, concerns and at the same time uh, the, the, the concerns coming from industry. I think that's, that's critically important. Um, Councillor uh, Holliday's uh, request for a report back. Uh, Councillor Fillion's request I think we'll probably get mixed support uh, on, on, on the council floor, um, though I think uh, having uh, heard directly from Councillor Cressy on the matter, he's, he, that he's struggled with, uh, with work in a downtown neighborhood uh, where the city um, isn't informing the, the local councillor uh, or the community of work that, that, that they'll be undertaking. Uh, and I, I, I do believe we have this, that same responsibility at least uh, in, uh, in, in, in theory, if not, or, or we should be in practice even if it's not written in and that motion doesn't pass, um, there's still an opportunity for the city divisions to engage local councillors in the community prior to their work. Um, as we're doing right now on McCall, which anyone that lives west and drives will see, there's a pretty significant amount of work going on in Dundas and McCall, and that will be going all night right in front of residential, uh, uh, the residential community. None of that was, they didn't seek approval from the city of, uh, from the local councillor, and um, they certainly would have got it because the work needs to be done. 
Um, but then the final motion from Councillor uh, Wong Tam, I think, uh, I add some clarification that, uh, that that's needed. Look, every year at budget time, I ask one question of the head of municipal licensing and standards, and that is, do you have the necessary resources to enforce your bylaws? Year after year, we've gotten well. We're going to restructure. We think we can do it. We don't like look the, at the core of this. What residents want to see, they don't care. The pa about the paper it's written on. They barely, and my apologies, they barely care about the bylaw the way it's written and the new bylaw or old bylaw. What they want is enforcement. What they want is the city to actually be there when they call or at least show up at some point shortly after or in the days following uh, when it can't be something that's captured uh, I, 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 24 hours later. Um, they want to pass so they can get it addressed um, because too often, We've got, uh, we've, we've got establishments, mostly bars or clubs, that won't follow the noise bylaw. Very basically, they won't shut their doors. And we don't have the resources to send people out all the time and check on them. We've got construction sites, and I took over uh, after Councillor Wong Tam in, 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 York, in Yorkville, and it's constant, constant calls about late night construction noise. And it's not because it's uh, it, it's just late night noise, and it's not that they shouldn't have any, like, uh, that we can say, oh, you live in a downtown area. No, this is incredibly loud construction noise happening at very close proximity to other residential condominium developments that we have approved. Thank you, Councillor. And so, uh, well, thank you. Thank you. I was just getting it going. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I I think there's general agreement that uh, among Torontonians that unwanted noise is a drag. But it also must be recognized that good things often come out of that noise, whether it be upgraded infrastructure, paved roads, fixed sidewalks, the building of new homes, and of course, as we intensify through development charges and Section 37 agreements, we get new playgrounds, new parks. And of course, overall, you're getting increased property values in many neighborhoods. At the same time, we must make sure that we protect our neighborhoods, we respect our neighborhoods, but also we allow commerce to continue. I think Anna, uh, Councillor Bylow's motion that allows for the continuous pouring of concrete allows the construction industry to prosper. It allows them to get on with the business of building new homes, and fixing our infrastructure. And at the same time, it allows them to finish their project quicker. We can put chains on these, on these construction companies and these projects, and it'll just stretch out the pain. The complaints will go for a longer period of time. They will be more intense. There'll be increased aggravation uh, as the project drags on. It's important to let construction companies get on with the work they're doing. I've got a big concern about Councillor Fillion's motion as I read it. The projects will go on longer, they will be more expensive, and will tie the hands uh, of the city. Overall, I'd like to thank staff for their work. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, they've been working on this for years. Their staff report stretches 31 pages. They hired outside experts to get opinions from them. They uh, met with uh, hundreds of uh, constituents. And they hired consultants that looked at some of the science of, of noise bylaw, and I think they brought back a package uh, that is worthy of support uh, with, of course, a couple of the amendments here. And once again, just to conclude, I would say that uh, Councillor Bylow's is a crucial amendment to allow construction projects to get done quickly, efficiency, uh, with the least cost and the least disruption in their local neighbourhoods. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm not going to move any motions, but I will comment on some a little bit later. I first of all want to thank uh, the staff as a chair of um, Economic and Community Development, and this matter came through our committee. We had lots of deputants who came to speak to this very important issue. Noise is a... Um, you know, an important issue in the city. It's uh, something that's very positive in, 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 in instances and negative in other instances and so on. 
we actually derive great economic benefits from noise because we're a music city, so there's noise associated with that. I understand that there are other elements of noise where you can wear ear uh, plugs and or headsets and so on where it doesn't make a lot of noise. I understand that as well. But we are working to expand the economic uh, development uh, opportunity and benefits. That being said, Speaker, there's no doubt that noise have a negative impact and a overall impact on areas of the community. And let me give you an example. In my ward, uh, every year there is an event that takes place uh, at a particular bar establishment. It's called a duck off. People go out, they cook outside, duck and so on, and they make lots of noise. It immunates all over the community. And we've done the measurements and our bylaw right now isn't helpful to help us with that. This new uh, proposed amendment to the, the bylaw will help us with that. I also draw your attention, Speaker, to the fact that um, the fines that are going to be incorporated in this new bylaw is much more significant. And I think people will actually start to pay attention. Those who are having a dramatically um, uh, negative impact on our community as a whole. I have gone through uh, the list, Speaker, because number of emails that I've received uh, when we were dealing with this particular issue. Every single one of them I've sent to staff for their comments, and they've addressed each one of them. I want to thank Mr. Grant, Mr. Strega, and others who have done a lot of work, and the whole team that are sitting there in the, in the gallery over the last five years. I think that probably about six years before that, I'd gone to the, one of the meetings to deal with some of these issues at Metro Hall. It's very contentious at that point. At committee, what we just dealt with this matter a couple of weeks ago, gave staff the opportunity to work with community groups as well as the construction trade organization, BUILD, and others to deal with some of the issues. And the motion that Councillor Bala has moved forward really addresses and helps that particular issue. I will be supporting Councillor Bylaw's motion. I will be supporting Councillor Holliday's motion, which is very helpful in collaboration with staff in order to review uh, the bylaw itself and to report back in the fourth quarter in 2020. I will not be supporting motion five by Councillor Fillion. I believe that this particular motion will end up costing us as a city a lot more money. You had a situation where the mayor actually work on the gardener and believe you did the overnight, reduce the construction time, reduce the amount of monies that this city would have had to pay. And I think that this particular motion is not very uh, helpful to us. Clearly, we've heard from Council Cressy and others and so on, when we actually as a staff, especially doing city work, we always take into consideration the interests of the people that we're trying to help, which is the residents of Toronto. And emergency response and so on, I think it's ex extremely important. I will be supporting and ask members to support the motion by Councillor Wong Tam. I think that's actually helpful. Uh, the motion by Councillor um, uh, Councillor Layton that staff has asked uh, to, to move forward with on the workplace uh, living area, I think that's fine. Um, Madam Speaker, we've looked at New York, at the bylaw that they brought in with respect to noise, and we've looked at ours. Theirs is not perfect either, nor am I suggesting or anyone at this point that ours is perfect. But there's an opportunity for us to refine the bylaw. Councillor um, uh, Holliday's motion speaks to that and will create that opportunity for us. So I ask you to support uh, what's actually in front of us. And again, I want to thank the staff because they've spent a lot of time. It's probably next to the King Street uh, pilot program, one of the most research uh, initiative and pro initiative that we have actually undertaken with respect to dealing with a matter that's in front of us here at council. So this no noise bylaw needs to be uh, supported by staff and to ensure that the residents understand we're always working to refine it. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Okay, our last speaker, Mayor Tory. Well, Speaker, thank you very much. And I want to begin, I know it sounds repetitive to thank the staff, but uh, I think when you even heard yesterday enumerated uh, in response to questions about uh, whether a deferral that we ended up dealing with today uh, would be uh, constructive or helpful, uh, what you also heard was a recitation of the unbelievable 
uh, process, unbelievable in the sense of how extensive it was that has preceded this day uh, and this report in terms of public meetings and consultations of all kinds. And I think the other thing that was said very honestly by uh, by our staff yesterday was that, you know, no matter where we go with this, no matter what answer one cho chose here or in the case of our professional staff, uh, there were going to be some people who were not satisfied with it. And so I think the, uh, the uh, best we can do is to try to come up with a balance, and I'm going to indicate some motions that I will be uh, supporting that I think help us to achieve that balance even better than a report that I think went a long way uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, a balance. Uh, and uh, the reason I didn't support a deferral is simply because we were told yesterday in no uncertain terms uh, by staff that this was really just not going to achieve uh, anything in the context of trying to come up with better answers because they'd worked and worked and worked and worked. And I went uh, to, uh, as some here in this room did, to one of the public consultations. And it was clear from that, as it often is in these meetings, that um, you know, th there were different groups of people there, but there were some uh, people who uh, probably, no matter what we recommended, were never going to be satisfied. And so that's fair enough, and that's why you have these meetings. Um, I should just say that, uh, so, so the motions that I will uh, support, and I don't think I'm leaving any out here, are uh, Councillor Wong Tams, uh, Deputy Mayor Bylaws, Councillor Leightons, Councillor Crezies. I think these all make a useful contribution to uh, a better uh, regime. The one that I will not support, um, and it's for reasons alluded to by Deputy Mayor Thompson, uh, is Councillor Fillion's, and uh, I guess it is for this reason. Um, I, first of all, I, I take considerable heart because I know it's true from what I heard Councillor Layton say, I believe, which is that in almost every case, in any event, there is an engagement as between city staff and the councillor that happens, and that the thoughts of councillors uh, on these matters are taken into account. But I think the point made by Councillor Deputy Mayor Thompson is also important, which is that I actually believe from having talked to a lot of people, and you all do too in your local areas, that people on balance, not unanimously because there is no such thing as unanimity on this thing, people on balance would rather we got the work done whenever we can sooner, within reason. You know, they're not saying, well, if it was going to be those, what do you call those, jackhammers going all night, six or eight of them outside their door, they're probably not in favor of that. But other kinds of reasonable noise uh, they're willing to put up with if it's for a shorter period of time. Uh, so that things get done faster, both so that the work can get done, so that the noise stops, and so they can get about their business. You know, if your street's torn up or, or something's going on in your neighbourhood, you'd like it to be finished uh, sooner than later. And I will say, because it was mentioned earlier by Councillor Deputy Mayor Thompson, that uh, the York Bay Young Ramp was an example of that. The people came up to me at the opening of the new ramp and said, well, on the one hand, we weren't happy about, I think and mostly in that case, they were hearing the beeping of the trucks. That was the main thing that was carried up, amazing numbers of stories up into the air. But on the other hand, we didn't really, we, we made a few calls, some of us did, but on balance, we were quite prepared to accept it because we knew that by having the work uh, happen over extended hours, it was going to get done sooner. And it wasn't so much because they even used the ramp. They just wanted it over with. Uh, and so we've been very careful as a city. Uh, I will uh, certainly uh, take responsibility for being uh, the person who came in here as mayor and said we should be using extended hours more often and even 24 hours whenever possible, but that we try to do that in a pragmatic, considerate way. Um, and it does involve discussion in many cases, if not all, with the local councillor. And there have been instances in which work being done, I recall one particular instance in uh, the north end of the city where the local councillor said no, and so we didn't. Uh, follow the extended hours, but um, I, I would just say that I think on balance most people, most people would say get it over with, spend a little more time, we'll put up with a little more noise for uh, extended hours so that you can be out of our hair uh, completely in a short period of time. So uh, I again want to say thank you to our uh, professional public service for a job I think as well done as could possibly be expected uh, and I want to say that I look forward to supporting of course the staff, re staff recommendations as modified by these motions uh, Wong Tam, Bailao, Leighton, Cressy uh, and I but I will be voting against uh, Councillor Fillion's for the reasons I've stated. Thank you Speaker. Thank you. Okay ready to vote. Motion number six is first by Councillor Wong Tam, recorded vote.
Councillor Perks, please. The motion carries unanimously, 25 in favor. Motion three. As amended, recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. The motion carries 21 to 4. Motion 5. Recorded vote. Councillor Carroll, please. Councillor Fletcher, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 8 to 17. Motion 1. Recorded vote. Councillor Carajans, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. Motion number one carries unanimously, 25 in favor. Motion four. Recorded vote. Councilor Mallow, please. Councilor Peruzza, please. <clears throat> the motion carries unanimously, 25 in favor. Motion seven, recorded vote. Councillor Bailao, please. The motion carries unanimously, 25 in favor. Item as amended, recorded vote. Councillor Bailao, please. Councillor Layton. Councillor Perks, please. And Councillor Peruzza, please. The item as amended carries 23 to 2. Okay. Um, did, did we? Okay, we have some motions we want to add. Okay, Councillor Pasternak. Well, when you're oh. mayor, you can. Councillor Pasternak. <laughs> yes, thank you, you. thank you, Madam the Mayor's motion. Madam Speaker, uh, I think it's on behalf of the mayor and myself. I'd just like to introduce this as this is an urgency of fast-moving events in Quebec. We're just uh, we want to make a uh, join Montreal in a public statement to uh, uh, support religious freedoms. Thank you. All in favor, carried. Councillor Bylaw, 
You have two. Yes. Yes, Madam Speaker. Uh, this motion is for a memorandum, uh, an MOU that will be signed May 1st, and because we don't have a council before it, that's the reason of the urgency. And the other motion is a liquor license application. Okay, so we'll vote on one first. On favor, carried. On the liquor license, on favor, carried. That's it. Um, Councillor Robinson, we have a couple minutes. Did you just want to release that item on page three, PH 4.5? Committee of Adjustment. Good. I do have three motions, um, oh, so, so I'm not, not a sure. Quick item. Yeah, I think maybe not. Okay. Well, Councillor Robinson, do you want to try it so we can get rid of it? Councillor Robinson. Sure, I can try. So, um, Committee of Adjustment, um, as many people know, we, has increased dramatically, like 96% over the last eight years. And so what I'm asking for here is an end-to-end -end review of the Committee of Adjustment and including in the public consultations residents and associations. Um, number two is really looking at the time period, not overly accessible to residents when it's happening in the morning. So having uh, staff review the timings of the hearings and thirdly, just a simple request of getting it up on the website. Um, other um, T-Lab, et cetera, have these documents, et cetera, accessible to the public up on the website. We're still not quite there yet, so just a push to get staff to uh, get that up and running. Okay. So, Thank you. Um, Kespala, are you asking questions? Okay, then it's not a quick item. I, I wanted to release... It is our next item. Not a quick item. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> It is all right, so you'll have to, we'll have to wait till after lunch then. You can ask the question. Councillor Perks, did you want to ask a question as well? I have, I have questions. Yeah, okay, so after lunch. Okay. All right, recess to 2 o'clock.